Typhoon, Chapter 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Russ Maxwell. Typhoon by Joseph Conrad. Chapter 1. Captain McWhirr of the steamer Nan Shan had a physiognomy that, in the order of material appearances, was the exact counterpart of his mind. It presented no marked characteristics of firmness or stupidity. It had no pronounced characteristics whatever. It was simply ordinary, irresponsive, and unruffled. The only thing his aspect might have been said to suggest, at times, was bashfulness, because he would sit in business offices ashore, sunburned and smiling faintly, with downcast eyes. When he raised them, they were perceived to be direct in their glance and of blue color. His hair was fair and extremely fine, clasping from temple to temple the bald dome of his skull in a clamp as of fluffy silk. The air of his face, on the contrary, carroty and flaming, resembled a growth of copper wire clipped short to the line of the lip. While no matter how close he shaved, fiery metallic gleams passed when he moved his head over the surface of his cheeks. He was rather below the medium height, a bit round-shouldered and so sturdy of limb that his clothes always looked a shade too tight for his arms and his legs. As if unable to grasp what is due to the differences of latitudes, he wore a brown bowler hat, a complete suit of a brownish hue, and clumsy black boots. These harbor togs gave to his thick figure an air of stiff and uncouth smartness. A thin silver watch chain looped his waistcoat, and he never left his ship for the shore without clutching in his powerful, hairy fist an elegant umbrella of the very best quality, but generally unrolled. Young Jukes, the chief mate, attending to his commander to the gangway, would sometimes venture to say, with the greatest gentleness, Allow me, sir, and possessing himself of the umbrella deferentially, would elevate the ferrule, shake the folds, twirl a neat furl in a jiffy, and hand it back, going through the performance with a face of such portentous gravity that Mr. Solomon Rout, the chief engineer, smoking his morning cigar over the skylight, would turn away his head in order to hide a smile. Oh, aye, the blessed gamp, thank ye, jukes, thank ye, would mutter Captain McWhirr heartily, without looking up. Having just enough imagination to carry him through each successive day, and no more, he was tranquilly sure of himself, and from the very same cause he was not in the least conceited. It is your imaginative superior who is touchy, overbearing, and difficult to please. But every ship Captain McWhirr commanded was the floating abode of harmony and peace. It was, in truth, as impossible for him to take a flight of fancy as it would be for a watchmaker to put together a chronometer, with nothing except a two-pound hammer and a whipsaw in the way of tools. Yet the interesting lives of men, so entirely given to the actuality of the bare existence, have their mysterious side. It was impossible, in Captain McWhirr's case, for instance, to understand what under heaven could have induced that perfectly satisfactory son of a petty grocer in Belfast to run away to the sea. And yet he had done that very thing at the age of 15. It was enough, when you thought it over, to give the idea of an immense, potent, and invisible hand thrust into the ant heap of the earth, laying hold of shoulders, knocking heads together, and setting the unconscious faces of the multitude towards inconceivable goals and in undreamt of directions. His father never really forgave him for this undutiful stupidity. We could have got on without him, he used to say later on, but there's the business, and he an only son too. His mother wept very much after his disappearance. As it had never occurred to him to leave word behind, he was mourned over for dead till, after eight months, his first letter arrived from Talcuano. It was short and contained the statement, We had very fine weather on our passage out. But evidently, in the writer's mind, the only important intelligence was to the effect that his captain had, on the very day of writing, entered him regularly on the ship's articles as ordinary seamen. Because I can do the work, he explained. The mother again wept copiously while the remark, Tom's an ass, expressed the emotions of the father. He was a corpulent man with a gift for sly chafing, which, to the end of his life, he exercised in his intercourse with his son, a little pityingly, as if upon a half-witted person. 
McWhir's visits to his home were necessarily rare, and in the course of years, he dispatched other letters to his parents, informing them of his successive promotions and of his movements upon the vast earth. In these missives could be found sentences like this, The heat here is very great, or On Christmas Day at 4 p.m., we fell in with some icebergs. The old people ultimately became acquainted with a good many names of ships and with the names of the skippers who commanded them, with the names of Scots and English ship owners, with the names of seas, oceans, straits, promontories, with outlandish names of lumber ports, of rice ports, of cotton ports, with the names of islands, with the names of their son's young woman. She was called Lucy. It did not suggest itself to him to mention whether he thought the name pretty. And then they died. The great day of McWhir's marriage came in due course, following shortly upon the great day when he got his first command. All these events had taken place many years before the morning when, in the chart room of the steamer Nan Shan, he stood confronted by the fall of a barometer he had no reason to distrust. The fall, taking into the account the excellence of the instrument, the time of the year, and the ship's position on the terrestrial globe, was of a nature ominously prophetic. But the red face of the man betrayed no sort of inward disturbance. Omens were as nothing to him, and he was unable to discover the message of a prophecy till the fulfillment had brought it home to his very door. That's a fall and no mistake, he thought. There must be some uncommonly dirty weather knocking about. The Nan Shan was on her way from the southward to the treaty port of Fu Chao with some cargo in her lower holds and 200 Chinese coolies returning to their village homes in the province of Fo Kien after a few years of work in various tropical colonies. The morning was fine. The oily sea heaved without a sparkle, and there was a queer white misty patch in the sky like a halo of the sun. The Ford deck, packed with Chinamen, was full of somber clothing, yellow faces, and pigtails, sprinkled over with a many good naked shoulders, for there was no wind, and the heat was close. The coolies lounged, talked, smoked, or stared over the rail. Some, drawing water over the side, sluiced each other. A few slept on hatches, while several small parties of six sat on their heels, surrounding iron trays with plates of rice and tiny teacups. And every single celestial of them was carrying with him all he had in the world, a wooden chest with a ringing lock and brass on the corners, containing the savings of his labors, some clothes of ceremony, sticks of incense, a little opium maybe, bits of nameless rubbish of conventional value, and a small hoard of silver dollars, toiled for in coal lighters, won in gambling houses or in petty trading, grubbed out of earth, sweated out in mines, on railway lines, in deadly jungle, under heavy burdens, amassed patiently, guarded with care, cherished fiercely. A cross swell had set in from the direction of Formosa Channel about 10 o'clock without disturbing these passengers much, because the Nan Shan, with her flat bottom, rolling chocks on bilges, and great breadth of beam, had the reputation of an exceptionally steady ship in a seaway. Mr. Jukes, in moments of expansion on shore, would proclaim loudly that the old girl was as good as she was pretty. It would never have occurred to Captain McWhir to express his favorable opinion so loud, or in terms so fanciful. She was a good ship, undoubtedly, and not old either. She had been built in Dumbarton less than three years before, to the order of a firm of merchants in Siam, Messrs. Sig and Son. When she lay afloat, finished in every detail, and ready to take up the work of her life, the builders contemplated her with pride. Sig has asked us for a reliable skipper to take her out, remarked one of the partners, and the other, after reflecting for a while, said, I think McWhir is ashore just at present. Is he? Well, then wire him at once. He's the very man, declared the senior, without a moment's hesitation. Next morning, McWhir stood before them unperturbed, having traveled from London by the Midnight Express after a sudden but undemonstrative parting with his wife. She was the daughter of a superior couple who had seen better days. We had better be going together over the ship, Captain, said the senior partner and the three men started to view the perfections of the Nan Shan from stem to stern, and from her keelson to the trucks of her two stumpy pole masts. Captain McWhir had begun by taking off his coat, which he hung on the end of a steam windlass, embodying all the latest improvements. My uncle wrote of you favorably by yesterday's mail to our good friends, Monsieur Sig, you know, and no doubt they'll continue you out there in command. 
said the junior partner. You'll be able to boast of being in charge of the handiest boat of her size on the coast of China, Captain, he added. Have you? Uh, thank ye, mumbled vaguely McWhir, to whom the view of a distant eventuality could appeal no more than the beauty of a wide landscape to a purblind tourist. And his eyes happening at the moment to be at rest upon the lock of the cabin door, he walked up to it, full of purpose, and began to rattle the handle vigorously, while he observed in his low, earnest voice, ah, You can't trust the workmen nowadays. A brand new lock, and it won't act at all. Stuck fast. See? See? As soon as they found themselves alone in their office across the yard, you praised that fellow up to Sig. What is it you see in him? asked the nephew with faint contempt. I admit he has nothing of your fancy skipper about him, if that's what you mean, said the elder man curtly. Is the foreman of the joiners of the Nanshan outside? Come in, Bates. How is it that you let Tate's people put us off with a defective lock on that cabin door? The captain could see directly he set eye on it. Have it replaced at once. The little straws, Bates, the little straws. The lock was replaced accordingly, and a few days afterwards, the Nan Shan steamed out to the east, without McWhir having offered any further remark as to her fittings, or having been heard to utter a single word hinting at pride in his ship, gratitude for his appointment, or satisfaction at his prospects. With a temperament neither loquacious nor taciturn, he found very little occasion to talk. There were matters of duty, of course, directions, orders, and so on. But the past being to his mind done with, and the future not there yet, the more general actualities of the day required no comment, because facts can speak for themselves with overwhelming precision. Old Mr. Sig liked the man a few words, and one that, you could be sure, would not try to improve upon his instructions. McWhir, satisfying these requirements, was continued in command of the Nan Shan, and applied himself to the careful navigation of his ship in the China Seas. She had come out on a British register, but after some time, Monsieur Sig judged it expedient to transfer her to the Siamese flag. At the news of the contemplated transfer, Jukes grew restless, as if under a sense of personal affront. He went about grumbling to himself and uttering short, scornful laughs. Fancy having a ridiculous Noah's Ark elephant in the ensign of one's ship, he said once at the engine room door. Dash me if I can stand it. I'll throw up the billet. Don't it make you sick, Mr. Rout? The chief engineer only cleared his throat with the air of a man who knows the value of a good billet. The first morning the new flag floated over the stern of the Nan Shan, Juke stood looking at it bitterly from the bridge. He struggled with his feelings for a while and then remarked, Queer flag for a man to sail under, sir. What's the matter with the flag? inquired Captain McWhir. Seems all right to me. And he walked across to the end of the bridge to have a good look. Well, it looks queer to me, burst out Jukes, greatly exasperated, and flung off the bridge. Captain McWhir was amazed at these manners. After a while, he stepped quietly into the chart room and opened his international signal code book at the plate where the flags of all the nations are correctly figured in gaudy rows. He ran his finger over them, and when he came to Siam, he contemplated with great attention the red field and the white elephant. Nothing could be more simple. But to make sure, he brought the book out on the bridge for the purpose of comparing the color drawing with the real thing at the flagstaff astern. When next Jukes, who was carrying on the duty that day with a sort of suppressed fierceness, happened on the bridge, his commander observed, There's nothing amiss with the flag. Isn't there? mumbled Jukes, falling on his knees before a deck locker and jerking therefrom viciously a spare lead line. Nope, I looked up the book. Length twice the breadth and the elephant exactly in the middle. I thought the people ashore would know how to make the local flag. <sighs> Stands to reason. You were wrong, Jukes. Well, sir, began Jukes, getting up excitedly. All I can say, he fumbled for the end of the coil of line with trembling hands. That's all right, Captain McWhir soothed him, sitting heavily on a little canvas folding stool he greatly affected. All you have to do is to take care they don't hoist the elephant upside down before they get quite used to it. Jukes flung the new lead line over on the foredeck with a loud, Here you are, bosun, don't forget to wet it thoroughly, and turned with immense resolution towards his commander. But Captain McWhir spread his elbows on the bridge rail comfortably. Because it would be, I suppose, uh, understood as a signal of distress, he went on. What do you think? 
That elephant there, I take it, stands for something in the nature of the Union Jack in the flag. Does it? yelled Jukes, so that every head on the Nanshan's deck looked towards the bridge. Then he sighed, and with sudden resignation, it would certainly be a damn distressful sight, he said meekly. Later in the day, he accosted the chief engineer with a confidential, Here, let me tell you the old man's latest. Mr. Solomon Rout, frequently alluded to as Long Saul, Old Saul, or Father Rout, from finding himself almost invariably the tallest man on board every ship he joined, had acquired the habit of a stooping, leisurely condescension. His hair was scant and sandy, his flat cheeks were pale, his bony wrists and long, scholarly hands were pale too, as though he had lived all his life in the shade. He smiled from on high at Jukes, and went on smoking and glancing about quietly, in the manner of a kind uncle lending an ear to the tale of an excited schoolboy. Then, greatly amused but impassive, he asked, And did you throw up the billet? No, cried Jukes, raising a weary, discouraged voice above the harsh buzz of the Nanshan's friction winches. All of them were hard at work, snatching slings of cargo high up to the end of long derricks, only as it seemed to let them rip down recklessly by the run. The cargo chains groaned in the gins, clinking on combings, rattled over the side, and the whole ship quivered with her long gray flanks smoking in wreaths of steam. No, cried Jukes, I didn't. What's the good? I might just as well fling my resignation at this bulkhead. I don't believe you can make a man like that understand anything. He simply knocks me over. At that moment, Captain McWhirr, back from the shore, crossed the deck, umbrella in hand, escorted by a mournful, self-possessed Chinaman, walking behind in paper-soled silk shoes and who also carried an umbrella. The master of the Nan Shan, speaking just audibly and gazing at his boots, as his manner was, remarked that it would be necessary to call at Fu Chao this trip, and desired Mr. Rout to have steam up tomorrow afternoon at one o'clock sharp. He pushed back his hat to wipe his forehead, observing at the same time that he hated going ashore anyhow. While overtopping him, Mr. Rout, without deigning a word, smoked austerely, nursing his right elbow in the palm of his left hand. Then Jukes was directed in the same subdued voice to keep the forward tween deck clear of cargo. Two hundred coolies were going to be put down there. The Bun Hin Company were sending that lot home. Twenty-five bags of rice would be coming off in a sandpan directly for stores. All seven years men they were, said Captain McWhirr, with a camphor wood chest to every man. The carpenter should be set to work nailing three-inch battens along the deck below, fore and aft, to keep these boxes from shifting in a seaway. Jukes had better look to it at once. Do you hear, Jukes? This Chinaman here was coming with the ship as far as Fu Chao. A sort of interpreter he would be. Bun Hin's clerk he was, and wanted to have a look at the space. Jukes had better take him forward. Did you hear, Jukes? Jukes took care to punctuate these instructions in proper places with the obligatory, yes, sir, ejaculated without enthusiasm. His brusque, come along, John, make look see, set the Chinaman in motion at his heels. Want you look see, all same look see can do, said Jukes, who, having no talent for foreign languages, mangled a very pigeon English cruelly. He pointed at the open hatch. Catchy number one PC place to sleep in, eh? He was gruff, as became his racial superiority but not unfriendly. The Chinaman, gazing sad and speechless into the darkness of the hatchway, seemed to stand at the head of a yawning grave. No catchy rain down there, savvy, pointed out Jukes. Suppose all ye same fine weather. One piecey coolie man come topside, he pursued, warming up imaginatively. Make so, foo, he expanded his chest and blew out his cheeks. Savvy, John. Breathe fresh air. Good, eh? Washing him PC pants, chow chow, topside. See, John? With his mouth and hands, he made exuberant motions of eating rice and washing clothes. And the Chinaman, who concealed his distrust of this pantomime, under a collected demeanor tinged by a gentle and refined melancholy, glanced out of his almond eyes from jukes to the hatch and back again. Very good, he murmured in a disconsolate undertone, and hastened smoothly along the decks, dodging obstacles in his course. He disappeared, ducking low under a sling of ten dirty gunny bags full of some costly merchandise and exhaling a repulsive smell. 
Captain McWhir, meantime, had gone on the bridge and into the chart room, where a letter, commenced two days before, awaited termination. These long letters began with the words, My darling wife, and the steward, between the scrubbing of the floors and the dusting of chronometer boxes, snatched at every opportunity to read them. They interested him much more than they possibly could the woman for whose eye they were intended, and this for the reason that they related in minute detail each successive trip of the Nan Shan. Her master, faithful to facts which alone his consciousness reflected, would set them down with painstaking care upon many pages. The house in a northern suburb to which these pages were addressed had a bit of a garden before the bow windows, a deep porch of good appearance, colored glass with imitation lead frame in the front door. He paid five and forty pounds a year for it and did not think the rent too high because Mrs. McWhir, a pretentious person with a scraggy neck and a disdainful manner, was admittedly ladylike and in the neighborhood considered as quite superior. The only secret of her life was her abject terror of the time when her husband would come home to stay for good. Under the same roof, there dwelt also a daughter called Lydia and a son, Tom. These two were but slightly acquainted with their father. Mainly they knew him as a rare but privileged visitor, who of an evening smoked his pipe in the dining room and slept in the house. The lanky girl, upon the whole, was rather ashamed of him. The boy was frankly and utterly indifferent, in a straightforward, delightful, unaffected way manly boys have. And Captain McWhir wrote home from the coast of China twelve times every year, desiring quaintly to be remembered to the children and subscribing himself your loving husband, as calmly as if the words so long used by so many men were, apart from their shape, worn out things and of a faded meaning. The China seas north and south are narrow seas. They are seas full of everyday eloquent facts, such as islands, sandbanks, reefs, swift and changeable currents, tangled facts that nevertheless speak to a seaman in a clear and definite language. Their speech appealed to Captain McWhir's sense of reality so forcibly that he had given up his stateroom below and practically lived all his days on the bridge of his ship, often having his meals sent up and sleeping at night in the chart room, and he indicted there his home letters. Each of them, without exception, contained the phrase, the weather has been very fine this trip, or some other form of a statement to that effect. And this statement, too, in its wonderful persistence, was of the same perfect accuracy as all the others they contained. Mr. Rout likewise wrote letters, only no one on board knew exactly how chatty he could be, pen in hand, because the chief engineer had enough imagination to keep his desk locked. His wife relished his style greatly. They were a childless couple, and Mrs. Rout, a big, high-bosomed, jolly woman of forty, shared with Mr. Rout's toothless and venerable mother a little cottage near Teddington. She would run over her correspondence at breakfast with lively eyes and scream out interesting passages in a joyous voice at the deaf old lady, prefacing each extract by the warning shout, Solomon says! She had the trick of firing off Solomon's utterances also upon strangers, astonishing them easily by the unfamiliar text and the unexpectedly jocular vein of these quotations. On the day the new curate called for the first time at the cottage, she found occasion to remark, As Solomon says, the engineers that go down to the sea in ships behold the wonders of sailor nature, when a change in the visitor's countenance made her stop and stare. Solomon, oh, Mrs. Rout, stuttered the young man, very red in the face. I must say, I don't... He's my husband, she announced in a great shout, throwing herself back in the chair. Perceiving the joke, she laughed immoderately with a handkerchief to her eyes, while she sat wearing a forced smile, and from his inexperience of jolly women, fully persuaded that she must be deplorably insane. They were excellent friends afterwards, for absolving her from irrelevant intention, he came to think she was a very worthy person indeed, and he learned in time to receive without flinching other scraps of Solomon's wisdom. For my part, Solomon was reported by his wife to have said once, Give me the dullest ass for a skipper before a rogue. There is a way to take a fool, but a rogue is smart and slippery. This was an airy generalization drawn from the particular case of Captain McWhir's honesty, which, in itself, had the heavy obviousness of a lump of clay. On the other hand, Mr. Jukes, unable to generalize, unmarried, 
and unengaged, was in the habit of opening his heart after another fashion to an old chum and former shipmate, actually serving as second officer on board an Atlantic liner. First of all, he would insist upon the advantages of the Eastern trade, hinting at its superiority to the Western Ocean Service. He extolled the sky, the seas, the ships, and the easy life of the Far East. The Nan Shan, he affirmed, was second to none as a sea boat. We have no brass-bound uniforms, but then we are like brothers here, he wrote. We all mess together and live like fighting cocks. All the chaps of the black squad are as decent as they make that kind, and old Saul, the chief, is a dry stick. We are good friends. As to our old man, you could not find a quieter skipper. Sometimes you would think he hadn't sense enough to see anything wrong, and yet it isn't that. Can't be. He has been in command for a good few years now. He doesn't do anything actually foolish, and he gets his ship along all right without worrying anybody. I believe he has brains enough to enjoy kicking up a row. I don't take advantage of him. I would scorn it. Outside the routine of duty, he doesn't seem to understand more than half of what you tell him. We get a laugh out of this at times. But it is dull, too, to be with a man like this in the long run. Old Saul says he hasn't much conversation. Conversation? Oh, Lord, he never talks. The other day, I had been yarning under the bridge with one of the engineers, and he must have heard us. When I came up to take my watch, he steps out of the chart room and has a good look all around, peeps over at the side lights, glances at the compass, squints up at the stars. That's his regular performance. By and by, he says, was that you talking just now in the port alleyway? Yes, sir. With the third engineer? Yes, sir. He walks off to starboard and sits under the dodger on a little camp stool of his. And for half an hour, perhaps, he makes no sound, except that I heard him sneeze once. Then, after a while, I hear him getting up over there, and he strolls across to port where I was. I can't understand what you can find to talk about, says he. Two solid hours. I'm not blaming you. I see people ashore at it all day long. And then in the evening, they sit down and keep at it over the drinks. Must be saying the same things over and over again. I can't understand. Did you ever hear anything like that? And he was so patient about it. It made me quite sorry for him. But he is exasperating too, sometimes. Of course, one would not do anything to vex him, even if it were worthwhile. But it isn't. He's so jolly innocent that if you were to put your thumb to your nose and wave your fingers at him, he would only wonder gravely to himself what got into you. He told me once quite simply that he found it very difficult to make out what made people always act so queerly. He's too dense to trouble about. And that's the truth. Thus wrote Mr. Jukes to his chum in the Western Ocean trade, out of the fullness of his heart and the liveliness of his fancy. He had expressed his honest opinion. It was not worthwhile trying to impress a man of that sort. If the world had been full of such men, life would have probably appeared to Jukes an unentertaining and unprofitable business. He was not alone in his opinion. The sea itself, as if sharing Mr. Jukes's good-natured forbearance, had never put itself out to startle the silent man who seldom looked up and wandered innocently over the waters with the only visible purpose of getting food, raiment, and house room for three people ashore. Dirty weather he had known, of course. He had been made wet, uncomfortable, tired in the usual way, felt at the time and presently forgotten, so that upon the whole he had been justified in reporting fine weather at home. But, he had never been given a glimpse of immeasurable strength and of immoderate wrath, the wrath that passes exhausted but never appeased, the wrath and fury of the passionate sea. He knew it existed, as we know that crime and abominations exist. He had heard of it as a peaceable citizen in a town hears of battles, famines, and floods, and yet knows nothing of what these things mean, though. Indeed, he may have been mixed up in a street row, have gone without his dinner once, or been soaked to the skin in a shower. Captain McWhirr had sailed over the surface of the oceans, as some men go skimming over the years of existence, to sink gently into a placid grave, ignorant of life to the last, without ever having been made to see all it may contain of perfidy, of violence, and of terror. There are on sea and land such men thus fortunate, or thus disdained by destiny, or by the sea. End of chapter one.
Chapter 2 of Typhoon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, May 2007. Typhoon by Joseph Conrad. Chapter 2. Observing the steady fall of the barometer, Captain McGuire thought, There's some dirty weather knocking about. This is precisely what he thought. He had had an experience of moderately dirty weather, the term dirty as applied to the weather implying only moderate discomfort to the seamen. Had he been informed by an indisputable authority that the end of the world was to be finally accomplished by a catastrophic disturbance of the atmosphere, he would have assimilated the information under the simple idea of dirty weather, and no other, because he had no experience of cataclysms, and belief does not necessarily imply comprehension. The wisdom of his county had pronounced by means of an act of Parliament, that before he could be considered as fit to take charge of a ship, he should be able to answer certain simple questions on the subject of circular storms, such as hurricanes, cyclones, typhoons, and apparently he had answered them, since he was now in command of the Nan Shan in the China Seas during the season of typhoons. But if he had answered, he remembered nothing of it. He was, however, conscious of being made uncomfortable by the clammy heat. He came out on the bridge and found no relief to his oppression. The air seemed thick. He gasped like a fish and began to believe himself greatly out of sorts. The Nan Shan was ploughing a vanishing furrow upon the circle of the sea that had the surface and the shimmer of an undulating piece of grey silk. The sun, pale and without rays, poured down leaden heat in a strangely indecisive light, and the Chinamen were lying prostrate about the decks. Their bloodless, pinched yellow faces were like the faces of bilious invalids. Captain McWhir noticed two of them especially, stretched out on their backs below the bridge. As soon as they had closed their eyes, they seemed dead. Three others, however, were quarrelling barbarously away forward, and one big fellow, half naked with Herculean shoulders, was hanging limply over a winch. Another, sitting on the deck, his knees up and his head drooping sideways in a girlish attitude, was plaiting his pigtail with infinite languor, depicted in his whole person and in the very movement of his fingers. The smoke struggled with difficulty out of the funnel, and instead of streaming away spread itself out like an infernal sort of cloud, smelling of sulphur and raining soot all over the decks. "'What the devil are you doing there, Mr. Jukes?' asked Captain McGuire. This unusual form of address, though mumbled rather than spoken, caused the body of Mr. Jukes to start as though it had been prodded under the fifth rib. He had had a low bench brought on the bridge and sitting on it, with a length of rope curled about his feet and a piece of canvas stretched over his knees, was pushing a sail-needle vigorously. He looked up, and his surprise gave to his eyes an expression of innocence and candour. "'I'm only roping some of that new set of bags we made last trip for whipping up coals,' he remonstrated gently. "'We shall want them for the next coaling, sir.' "'What became of the others?' "'Why, worn out, of course, sir.' Captain McWhir, after glaring down irresolutely at his chief mate, disclosed the gloomy and cynical conviction that more than half of them had been lost overboard, if only the truth was known, and retired to the other end of the bridge. Jukes, exasperated by this unprovoked attack, broke the needle at the second stitch, and dropping his work, got up and cursed the heat in a violent undertone. The propeller thumped, the three Chinamen forward had given up squabbling very suddenly, and the one who had been plaiting his tail clasped his legs and stared dejectedly over his knees. The lurid sunshine cast faint and sickly shadows. The swell ran higher and swifter every moment, and the ship lurched heavily in the smooth, deep hollows of the sea. "'I wonder where that beastly swell comes from,' said Jukes aloud, recovering himself after a stagger. "'North-east,' grunted the literal McWhir from his side of the bridge. "'There's some dirty weather knocking about. Go and look at the glass.' When Jukes came out of the chart-room, the cast of his countenance had changed to thoughtfulness and concern. He caught hold of the bridge-rail and stared ahead. The temperature in the engine-room had gone up to a hundred and seventeen degrees. Irritated voices were ascending through the skylight, and through the fiddle of the stokehold in a sh harsh and resonant uproar, mingled with angry clangs and scrapes of metal, as if men with limbs of iron and throats of bronze had been quarrelling down there. The second engineer was falling foul of the stokers for letting the steam go down. He was a man with arms like a blacksmith and generally feared. But that afternoon the stokers were answering him back recklessly, and slammed the furnace doors with the fury of despair. Then the noise ceased suddenly, and the second engineer appeared, emerging out of the stokehole streaked with grime and soaking wet like a chimney-sweep coming out of a well. As soon as his head was clear of the fiddle, he began to scold Jukes for not trimming properly the stokehold ventilators. 
and in answer Jukes made with his hands deprecatory soothing signs, meaning, "'No wind! Can't be helped! You can see for yourself!' But the other wouldn't hear reason. His teeth flashed angrily in his dirty face. He didn't mind, he said, the trouble of punching their blanked heads down there, blank his soul, but did the condemned sailors think you could keep steam up in the godforsaken boilers simply by knocking the blanked stokers about? No, by George! You had to get some draught, too. May he be everlastingly blanked for a swab-headed deckhand if you didn't. And the chief, too, rampaging before the steam gauge and carrying on like a lunatic up and down the engine room ever since noon. What did Jukes think he was stuck up there for if he couldn't get one of his decayed good-for-nothing deck cripples to turn the ventilators to the wind? The relations of the engine room and the deck of the Nan Shan were, as is known, of a brotherly nature. Therefore Jukes leaned over and begged the other in a restrained tone not to make a disgusting ass of himself. The skipper was on the other side of the bridge. But the second declared mutinously that he didn't care a rap who was on the other side of the bridge, and Jukes, passing in a flash from lofty disapproval into a state of exaltation, invited him in unflattering terms to come up and twist the beastly things to please himself, and catch such wind as a donkey of his sort could find. The second rushed up into the fray. He flung himself at the port ventilator as though he meant to tear it out bodily and toss it overboard. All he did was move the cowl round a few inches with an enormous expenditure of force, and seemed spent in the effort. He leaned against the back of the wheelhouse, and Jukes walked up to him. "'Oh, heavens!' ejaculated the engineer in a feeble voice. He lifted his eyes to the sky, and then let his glassy stare descend to meet the horizon that, tilting up to an angle of forty degrees, seemed to hang on a slant for a while, and settle down slowly. "'Heavens! Phew! What's up, anyhow?' Jukes, straddling his long legs like a pair of compasses, put on an air of superiority. "'We're going to catch it this time,' he said. "'The barometer is tumbling down like anything, Harry. And you trying to kick up that silly row.' The word barometer seemed to revive the second engineer's mad animosity. Collecting afresh all his energies, he directed Jukes in a low and brutal tone to shove the unmentionable instrument down his gory throat. Who cared for his crimson barometer? It was the steam, the steam that was going down, and what between the firemen going faint and the chief going silly, it was worse than a dog's life for him. He didn't care a tinker's curse how soon the whole show was blown out of the water. He seemed on the point of having a cry, but after regaining his breath he muttered darkly, I'll faint them, and dashed off. He stopped upon the fiddle long enough to shake his fist at the unnatural daylight, and dropped into the dark hole with a whoop. When Jukes turned, his eyes fell upon the rounded back and the big red ears of Captain McWhirr, who had come across. He did not look at his chief officer, but said at once, That's a very violent man, that second engineer. Jolly good second, anyhow, grunted Jukes. They can't keep up steam, he added rapidly, and made a grab at the rail against the coming lurch. Captain McWhirr, unprepared, took a run and brought himself up with a jerk by an awning stanchion. A profane man, he said obstinately. If this goes on, I'll have to get rid of him the first chance. It's the heat, said Jukes. The weather's awful. It would make a saint swear. Even up here I feel exactly as if I had my head tied up in a woollen blanket. Captain McWhirr looked up. Do you mean to say, Mr. Jukes, you ever had your head tied up in a blanket? What was that for? It's a manner of speaking, sir, said Jukes stolidly. Some of you fellows do go on. What's that about saint swearing? I wish you wouldn't talk so wild. What sort of saint would that be that would swear? No more saint than yourself, I expect. And what's a blanket got to do with it? Or the weather, either. The heat does not make me swear, does it? It's filthy bad temper, that's what it is. And what's the good of your talking like this?" Thus Captain McWhirr expostulated against the use of images in speech, and at the end electrified Jukes by a contemptuous snort, followed by words of passion and resentment. "'Damn! I'll fire him out of the ship if he don't look out!' And Jukes, incorrigible, thought, "'Goodness me! Somebody's put a new insight to my old man. Here's temper, if you like. Of course it's the weather. What else? It would make an angel quarrelsome, let alone a saint." All the Chinamen on deck appeared at their last gasp. At its setting the sun had a diminished diameter, and an expiring brown, rayless glow, as if millions of centuries elapsing since the morning had brought it near its end. A dense bank of cloud became visible to the northward. It had a sinister dark olive tint that lay low and motionless upon the sea resembling a solid obstacle in the path of the ship. She went floundering towards it like an exhausted creature driven to its death. The coppery twilight retired slowly, and the darkness brought out overhead a swarm of unsteady big stars that, as if blown upon, 
flickered exceedingly, and seemed to hang very near the earth. At eight o'clock, Jukes went into the chart-room to write up the ship's log. He copied neatly out of the rough book the number of miles, the course of the ship, and in the column for wind, scrawled the world calm from top to bottom of the eight hours since noon. He was exasperated by the continuous, monotonous rolling of the ship. The heavy inkstand would slide away in a manner that suggested perverse intelligence in dodging the pen. Having written in the large space under the head of remarks, heat very oppressive, he stuck the end of the penholder in his teeth, pipe fashion, and mopped his face carefully. Ship rolling heavily in a high cross swell, he began again, and commented to himself, heavily is no word for it. Then he wrote, sunset threatening, with a low bank of clouds to north and east. Sky clear overhead. Sprawling over the table with a rested pen, he glanced out of the door, and in that frame of his vision he saw all the stars flying upwards between the teakwood jams on a black sky. The whole lot took flight together and disappeared, leaving only a blackness flecked with white flashes, for the sea was as black as the sky, and speckled with foam afar. The stars that had flown to the roll came back on the return swing of the ship, rushing downwards in their glittering multitude, not of fiery points, but enlarged to tiny disks brilliant with a clear, wet sheen. Dukes watched the flying big stars for a moment, and then wrote, 8 p.m., swell increasing, ship labouring and taking water on her decks, battened down the coolies for the night, barometer still falling. He paused and thought to himself, perhaps nothing whatever will come of it. And then he closed resolutely his entries, every appearance of a typhoon coming on. On going out he had to stand aside, and Captain McWhirr strode over the doorstep without saying a word or making a sign. "'Shut the door, Mr. Jukes, will you?' he cried from within. Jukes turned back to do so, muttering ironically, "'Ready to catch cold, I suppose?' It was his watch below, but he yearned for communion with his kind, and he remarked cheerily to the second mate, "'Doesn't look so bad after all, does it?' The second mate was marching to and fro on the bridge, tripping down with small steps one moment, and the next climbing with difficulty the shifting slope of the deck. At the sound of Duke's voice he stood still, facing forward, but made no reply. "'Hallo, that's a heavy one,' said Jukes, swaying to meet the long roll till his lowered hand touched the planks. This time the second mate made in his throat a noise of an unfriendly nature. He was an oldish, shabby little fellow, with bad teeth and no hair on his face. He had been shipped in a hurry in Shanghai, that trip when the second officer brought from home had delayed the ship three hours in port by contriving, in some manner Captain McWhirr could never understand, to fall overboard into an empty coal-lighter lying alongside, and had to be sent ashore to the hospital with concussion of the brain and a broken limb or two. Jukes was not discouraged by the unsympathetic sound. "'The Chinamen must be having a lovely time of it down there,' he said. "'It's lucky for them the old girl has the easiest roll of any ship I've ever been in. There, now. This one wasn't so bad.' "'You wait.' snarled the second mate. With his sharp nose, red at the tip, and his thin, pinched lips, he always looked as though he were raging inwardly. And he was concise in his speech to the point of rudeness. All his time off duty he spent in his cabin with the door shut, keeping so still in there that he was supposed to fall asleep as soon as he had disappeared. But the man who came in to wake him for his watch on deck would invariably find him with his eyes wide open, flat on his back in the bunk, and glaring irritably from a soiled pillow. He never wrote any letters did not seem to hope for news from anywhere, and though he had been heard once to mention West Hartlepool, it was with extreme bitterness and only in connection with the extortionate charges of a boarding-house. He was one of those men who are picked up at need in the ports of the world. They are competent enough, appear hopelessly hard up, show no evidence of any sort of vice, and carry about them all the signs of manifest failure. They come aboard on an emergency, care for no ship afloat, live in their own atmosphere of casual connection amongst their shipmates who know nothing of them, and make up their minds to leave at inconvenient times. They clear out with no words of leave-taking in some godforsaken port other men would fear to be stranded in, and go ashore in company of a shabby sea-chest, corded like a treasure-box, with an air of shaking the ship's dust off their feet. "'You wait,' he repeated, balanced in great swings with his back to Jukes, motionless and implacable. "'Do you mean to say we're going to catch it hot?' asked Jukes, with boyish interest. "'Say? I say nothing. You don't catch me.' with a mixture of pride, scorn, and cunning, as if Duke's question had been a trap cleverly detected. "'Oh, no! None of you here shall make a fool of me if I know it,' he mumbled to himself. Jukes reflected rapidly that this second mate was a mean little beast, and in his heart he wished poor Jack Allen had never smashed himself up in the coal-lighter. The far-off blackness ahead of the ship was like another night seen through the starry night of the earth. 
the starless night of the immensities beyond the created universe, revealed in its appalling stillness through a low fissure in the glittering sphere of which the earth is the kernel. "'Whatever there might be about,' said Jukes, "'we are steaming straight into it.' "'You've said it,' caught up the second mate, always with his back to Jukes. "'You've said it, mind, not I.' "'Oh, go to Jericho,' said Jukes frankly, and the other emitted a triumphant little chuckle. "'You've said it,' he repeated. "'And what of that? I've known some real good men get into trouble with their skippers for saying a damn sight less,' answered the second mate feverishly. "'Oh, no, you don't catch me.' "'You seem deucedly anxious not to give yourself away,' said Jukes, completely soured by such absurdity. "'I wouldn't be afraid to say what I think. I, to me, that's no great trick. I am nobody, and well I know it.' The ship, after a pause of comparative steadiness, started upon a series of rolls, one worse than the other, and for a time Jukes, preserving his equilibrium, was too busy to open his mouth. As soon as the violent swinging had quieted down somewhat, he said, "'This is a bit too much of a good thing.' Whether anything is coming or not, I think she ought to be put head on to that swell. The old man has just gone in to lie down. Hang me if I don't speak to him." But when he opened the door of the chart-room, he saw his captain reading a book. Captain McGuir was not lying down. He was standing up with one hand grasping the edge of the bookshelf, and the other holding open before his face a thick volume. The lamp wriggled in the jimbles, the loosened books toppled from side to side on the shelf, the long barometer swung in jerky circles, the table altered its slant every moment. In the midst of all this stir and movement, Captain McGuir, holding on, showed his eyes above the upper edge, and asked, "'What's the matter?' "'Swell getting worse, sir.' "'Notice that in here,' muttered Captain McGuir. "'Anything wrong?' Jukes, inwardly disconcerted by the seriousness of the eyes looking at him over the top of the book, produced an embarrassed grin. "'Rolling like old boots,' he said sheepishly. "'Aye, very heavy, very heavy. What do you want?' At this Jukes lost his footing and began to flounder. "'I was thinking of our passengers.' he said, in the manner of a man clutching at a straw. "'Passengers?' wondered the captain gravely. "'What passengers?' "'Why, the Chinaman, sir,' explained Jukes, very sick of this conversation. "'The Chinaman! Why don't you speak plainly? Couldn't tell what you meant. Never heard a lot of coolies spoken of as passengers before. Passengers, indeed. What's come to you?' Captain McWhir, closing the book on his forefinger, lowered his arm and looked completely mystified. "'Why are you thinking of the Chinaman, Mr. Jukes?' he inquired. Jukes took a plunge, like a man driven to it. She's rolling her decks full of water, sir. Thought you might put her head on, perhaps, for a while. Till this goes down a bit. Very soon, I dare say. Head to the eastward. I never knew a ship roll like this. He held on in the doorway, and Captain McWhir, feeling his grip on the shelf inadequate, made up his mind to let go in a hurry, and fell heavily on the couch. Head to the eastward, he said, struggling to sit up. That's more than four points off her course. Yes, sir, fifty degrees would just bring her head far enough round to meet this. Captain McGuire was now sitting up. He had not dropped the book, and he had not lost his place. To the eastward, he repeated with dawning astonishment. To the— Where do you think we're bound to? You want me to haul a full-powered steamship four points off her course to make the Chinaman comfortable? Now I've heard more than enough of mad things done in the world, but this— If I didn't know you, Jukes, I would think you were in liquor. Steer four points off— and what afterwards? Steer four points over the other way, I suppose, to make the course good. What put it into your head that I would start to tack a steamer as if she were a sailing ship? Jolly good thing she isn't, threw in Jukes with bitter readiness. She would have rolled every blessed stick out of her this afternoon. Aye, and you would just have had to stand and see them go, said Captain McGuire, showing a certain animation. It's a dead calm, isn't it? It is, sir. But there's something out of the common coming, for sure. Maybe. "'I suppose you have a notion I should be getting out of the way of that dirt,' said Captain McGuire, speaking with the utmost simplicity of manner and tone, and fixing the oilcloth on the floor with a heavy stare. Thus he noticed neither Duke's discomfiture, nor the mixture of vexation and astonished respect on his face. "'Now, here's this book,' he continued with deliberation, slapping his thigh with the closed volume. "'I've been reading the chapter on the storms there.' This was true. He had been reading the chapter on the storms. When he had entered the chart-room, it was with no intention of taking the book down. Some influence in the air—the same influence, probably, that caused the steward to bring without orders the captain's sea-boots and oilskin coat up to the chart-room—had, as it were, guided his hand to the shelf, and without taking the time to sit down, he had waded with a conscious effort into the terminology of the subject. He lost himself amongst advancing semicircles, left and right-hand quadrants, the curves of the tracks, the probable wearing of the centre, the shifts of the wind, and the readings of the barometer. 
He tried to bring all these things into a definite relation to himself, and ended by becoming contemptuously angry with such a lot of words, and with so much advice, all headwork and supposition, without a glimmer of certitude. "'It's the damnedest thing, Jukes,' he said. "'If a fellow was to believe all that's in there, he would be running most of his time all over the sea trying to get behind the weather.' Again he slapped his leg with the book, and Jukes opened his mouth, but said nothing. "'Running to get behind the weather. Do you understand that, Mr. Jukes? It's the maddest thing!' ejaculated Captain McGuir, with pauses, gazing at the floor profoundly. "'You would think an old woman had been writing this. It passes me. If that thing means anything useful, then it means that I should at once alter the course away, away to the devil somewhere, and come booming down on Fu Chao from the northward at the tail of this dirty weather that's supposed to be knocking about in our way. From the north! Do you understand, Mr. Jukes? Three hundred extra miles to the distance, and a pretty coal bill to show. I couldn't bring myself to do that if every word in there was gospel truth, Mr. Jukes. Don't you expect me?" And Jukes, silent, marvelled at this display of feeling and loquacity. But the truth is, that you don't know if the fellow is right anyhow. How can you tell what a gale is made of till you get to it? He isn't aboard here, is he? Very well. Here he says that the centre of them things bears eight points off the wind. But we haven't got any wind, for all the barometer is falling. Where's his centre now? We will get the wind presently, mumbled Jukes. Let it come, then, said Captain McGuire, with dignified indignation. It's only to let you see, Mr. Jukes, that you don't find everything in books. All these rules for dodging breezes and circumventing the winds of heaven, Mr. Jukes, seem to me the maddest thing when you come to look at it sensibly." He raised his eyes, saw Jukes gazing at him dubiously, and tried to illustrate his meaning. "'About as queer as your extraordinary notion of dodging the ship head to sea, for I don't know how long, to make the Chinamen comfortable. Whereas all we've got to do is take them to Fu Chao, being time to get there before noon on Friday. If the weather delays me, very well. There's your log-book to talk straight about the weather. But suppose I went swinging off my course and came in two days late, and they asked me, where have you been all that time, Captain? What could I say to that? Went around dodging the bad weather, I would say. It must have been damn bad, they would say. Don't know, I would have to say. I've dodged clear of it. See that, Jukes? I have been thinking it all out this afternoon." He looked up again in his unseeing, unimaginative way. No one had ever heard him say so much at one time. Jukes, with his arms open in the doorway, was like a man invited to behold a miracle. Unbounded wonder was the intellectual meaning of his eye, while incredulity was seated in his whole countenance. "'A gale is a gale, Mr. Jukes,' resumed the captain, and a full-powered steamship has got to face it. There's just so much dirty weather knocking about the world, and the proper thing is to go through it with none of what old Captain Wilson of the Melita calls storm strategy. The other day ashore I heard him hold forth about it to a lot of shipmasters who came in and sat at a table next to mine. It seemed to me the greatest nonsense. He was telling them how he outmaneuvered, I think he said, a terrific gale, so that it never came nearer than fifty miles to him. A neat piece of headwork, he called it. How he knew there was a terrific gale fifty miles off beats me altogether. It was like listening to a crazy man. I would have thought Captain Wilson was old enough to know better." Captain McGuire ceased for a moment, then said, "'Is your watch below, Mr. Jukes?' Jukes came to himself with a start. "'Yes, sir.' "'Leave orders to call me at the slightest change,' said the captain. He reached up to put the book away, and tucked his legs upon the couch. "'Shut the door so that it won't fly open, will you? I can't stand a door banging. They've put a lot of rubbishy locks into this ship, I must say.' Captain McGuire closed his eyes. He did so to rest himself. He was tired, and he experienced that state of mental vacuity which comes at the end of an exhaustive discussion that has liberated some belief matured in the course of meditative years. He had indeed been making his confession of faith, had he only known it, and its effect was to make Jukes and the other side of the door stand scratching his head for a good while. Captain McGuire opened his eyes. He thought he must have been asleep. What was that loud noise? Wind? Why had he not been called? The lamp wriggled in its jimbles. The barometer swung in circles, the table altered its slant every moment. A pair of limp sea-boots with collapsed tops went sliding past the couch. He put out his hand instantly and captured one. Duke's face appeared in a crack of the door, only his face, very red, with staring eyes. The flame of the lamp leaped, a piece of paper flew up, a rush of air enveloped Captain McGuire. Beginning to draw on the boot, he directed an expectant gaze at Duke's swollen, excited features. "'Come on like this!' shouted Jukes. Five minutes ago! All of a sudden!' The head disappeared with a bang, and a heavy splash and patter of drops swept past the closed door as if a pailful of melted lead had been flung against the house. 
A whistling could be heard now upon the deep vibrating noise outside. The stuffy chart room seemed as full of draughts as a shed. Captain McWhirr collared the other sea boot on its violent passage along the floor. He was not flustered, but he could not find at once the opening for inserting his foot. The shoes he had flung off were scurrying from end to end of the cabin, gambling playfully over each other like puppies. As soon as he stood up, he kicked at them viciously, but without effect. He threw himself into the attitude of a lunging fencer to reach after his oilskin coat, and afterwards he staggered all over the confined space while he jerked himself into it. Very grave, straddling his legs far apart, and stretching his neck, he started to tie deliberately the strings of his sou'wester under his chin, with thick fingers that trembled slightly. He went through all the movements of a woman putting on her bonnet before a glass, with a strained, listening attention, as though he had expected every moment to hear the shout of his name in the confused clamour that had suddenly beset his ship. Its increase filled his ears while he was getting ready to go out and confront whatever it might mean. It was tumultuous and very loud, made up of the rush of the wind, the crashes of the sea, with that prolonged deep vibration of the air, like the roll of an immense and remote drum beating the charge of the gale. He stood for a moment in the light of the lamp, thick, clumsy and shapeless in his panoply of combat, vigilant and red-faced. "'There's a lot of weight in this,' he muttered. As soon as he attempted to open the door, the wind caught it. Clinging to the handle, he was dragged out over the doorstep, and at once found himself engaged with the wind in a sort of personal scuffle, whose object was the shutting of that door. At the last moment a tongue of air scurried in and licked out the flame of the lamp. Ahead of the ship he perceived a great darkness lying upon a multitude of white flashes. On the starboard beam a few amazing stars drooped dim and fitful above an immense waste of broken seas, as if seen through a mad drift of smoke. On the bridge a knot of men, indistinct and toiling, were making great efforts in the light of the wheelhouse windows that shone mistily on their heads and backs. Suddenly darkness closed upon one pane, then on another. The voices of the lost group reached him after the manner of men's voices in a gale, in shreds and fragments of forlorn shouting snatched past the ear. All at once Duke appeared at his side, yelling, with his head down, "'Watch! Put in wheelhouse shutters! Glass! Afraid! Blow in!' Jukes heard his commander upbraiding. This! Come! Anything! Warning! Call me! He tried to explain, with the uproar pressing on his lips. Light air! Remained! Bridge! Sudden! North-east! Could turn! Thought! You! Sure! Here! They had gained the shelter of the weather cloth, and could converse with raised voices as people quarrel. I got the hands along to cover up all the ventilators. Good job I had remained on deck. I didn't think you would be asleep, and so—' "'What did you say, sir? What?' "'Nothing!' cried Captain McGuire. "'I said all right!' "'By all the powers we've got it this time!' observed Dukes in a howl. "'You haven't altered her course?' inquired Captain McGuire, straining his voice. "'No, sir, certainly not. Wind came out right ahead, and here comes the head sea!' A plunge of the ship ended in a shock as if she had landed her forefoot upon something solid. After a moment of stillness a lofty flight of sprays drove hard with the wind upon their faces. "'Keep her at it as long as we can!' shouted Captain McGuire. Before Dukes had squeezed the salt water out of his eyes, all the stars had disappeared. End of chapter 2「Chapter 3 of Typhoon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Typhoon by Joseph Conrad Chapter 3 Jukes was as ready a man as any half-dozen young mates that may be caught by casting a net upon the waters. And though he had been somewhat taken aback by the startling viciousness of the first squall, he had pulled himself together on the instant, had called out, the hands, and had rushed them along to secure such openings about the deck as had not been already battened down earlier in the evening. Shouting in his fresh, stentorian voice, "'Jump, boys, and bear a hand!' he led in the work, telling himself the while that he had just expected this. But at the same time he was growing aware that this was rather more than he had expected." from the first stir of the air felt on his cheek the gale seemed to take upon itself the accumulated impetus of an avalanche heavy sprays enveloped the nanshan from stem to stern 
and instantly, in the midst of her regular rolling, she began to jerk and plunge as though she had gone mad with fright. Jukes thought, this is no joke. While he was exchanging explanatory yells with his captain, a sudden lowering of the darkness came upon the night, falling before their vision like something palpable. It was as if the masked lights of the world had been turned down. Jukes was uncritically glad to have his captain at hand. It relieved him as though that man had, by simply coming on deck, taken most of the gale's weight upon his shoulders. Such is the prestige, the privilege, and the burden of command. Captain McQuirr could expect no relief of that sort from anyone on earth. Such is the loneliness of command. He was trying to see, with that watchful manner of a seaman who stares into the wind's eye as if into the eye of an adversary, to penetrate the hidden intention and guess the aim and force of the thrust. The strong wind swept at him out of a vast obscurity. He felt under his feet the uneasiness of his ship, and he could not even discern the shadow of her shape. He wished it were not so, and very still he waited feeling stricken by a blind man's helplessness. To be silent was natural to him, dark or shine. Jukes, at his elbow, made himself heard, yelling cheerily in the gusts. "'We must have got the worst of it at once, sir.' A faint burst of lightning quivered all around, as if flashed into a cavern, into a black and secret chamber of the sea, with a floor of foaming crests. It unveiled for a sinister, fluttering moment a ragged mass of clouds hanging low, the lurch of the long outlines of the ship, the black figures of men caught on the bridge, heads forward as if petrified in the act of budding. The darkness palpitated down upon all this, and then the real thing came at last. It was something formidable and swift, like the sudden smashing of a vial of wrath. It seemed to explode all round the ship with an overpowering concussion and a rush of great waters as if an immense dam had been blown up to windward. In an instant the men lost touch of each other. This is the disintegrating power of a great wind. It isolates one from one's kind. An earthquake, a landslip, an avalanche overtake a man incidentally, as it were, without passion. A furious gale attacks him like a personal enemy, tries to grasp his limbs, fastens upon his mind, seems to rout his very spirit out of him. Duke was driven away from his commander. He fancied himself whirled a great distance through the air. Everything disappeared, even, for a moment, his power of thinking. But his hand had found one of the rail stanchions. His distress was by no means alleviated by an inclination to disbelieve the reality of this experience. Though young, he had seen some bad weather, and had never doubted his ability to imagine the worst. But this was so much beyond his powers of fancy that it appeared incompatible with the existence of any ship whatever. He would have been incredulous about himself in the same way, perhaps, had he not been so harassed by the necessity of exerting a wrestling effort against a force trying to tear him away from his hold. Moreover, the conviction of not being utterly destroyed returned to him through the sensations of being half-drowned, bestially shaking, and partly choked. It seemed to him he remained there, precariously alone, with this stanchion for a long, long time. The rain poured on him, flowed, drove in sheets. He breathed in gasps, and sometimes the water he swallowed was fresh and sometimes it was salt. For the most part he kept his eyes shut tight, as if suspecting his sight might be destroyed in the immense flurry of the elements. When he ventured to blink hastily, he derived some moral support from the green gleam of the starboard light shining feebly upon the flight of rain and sprays. He was actually looking at it when its rays fell upon the uprearing sea which put it out. He saw the head of the wave topple over, adding the might of its crash to the tremendous uproar raging around him, and almost at the same instant the stanchion was wrenched away from his embracing arms. 
after a crushing thump on his back, he found himself suddenly afloat and borne upwards. His first irresistible notion was that the whole China Sea had climbed on the bridge. Then, more sanely, he concluded himself gone overboard. All the time he was being tossed, flung, and rolled in great volumes of water. He kept on repeating mentally, with the utmost precipitation, the words, My God, my God, my God, my God. All at once, in a revolt of misery and despair, he formed the crazy resolution to get out of that, and he began to thresh about with his arms and legs. But as soon as he commenced his wretched struggles, he discovered that he had become somehow mixed up with a face, an oilskin coat, somebody's boots. He clawed ferociously all these things in turn, lost them and found them again, lost them once more, and finally was himself caught in the firm clasp of a pair of stout arms. He returned the embrace closely round a thick, solid body. He had found his captain. They tumbled over and over, tightening their hug. Suddenly the water let them down with a brutal bang and stranded against the side of the wheelhouse. Out of breath and bruised, they were left to stagger up in the wind and hold on where they could. Jukes came out of it rather horrified, as though he had escaped some unparalleled outage directed at his feelings. It weakened his faith in himself. He started shouting aimlessly to the man he could feel near him in that fiendish blackness. "'Is it you, sir? Is it you, sir?' Till his temples seemed ready to burst, and he heard in answer a voice as if crying far away, as if screaming to him fretfully from a great distance, the one word, yes. Other seas swept again over the bridge. He received them defenselessly, right over his bare head, with both his hands engaged in holding. The motion of the ship was extravagant. Her lurches had an appalling helplessness. She pitched as if taking a header into a void, and seemed to find a wall to hit every time. When she rolled, she fell on her side headlong, and she would be righted back by such a demolishing blow that Jukes felt her reeling as a club man reels before he collapses. The gale howled and scuffled about gigantically in the darkness, as though the entire world were one black gully. At certain moments the air streamed against the ship as if sucked through a tunnel with a concentrated solid force of impact that seemed to lift her clean out of the water and keep her up for an instant, with only a quiver running through her from end to end. And then she would begin her tumbling again as if dropped back into a boiling cauldron. Jukes tried hard to compose his mind and judge things coolly. The sea, flattened down in the heavier gusts, would uprise and overwhelm both ends of the Nanshan in snowy rushes of foam, expanding wide beyond both rails into the night. And on this dazzling sheet, spread under the blackness of the clouds and emitting a bluish glow, Captain Macquare could catch a desolate glimpse of a few tiny specks, black as ebony, the tops of the hatches, the battened companions, the heads of covered winches, the foot of a mast. This was all he could see of his ship, her middle structure covered by the bridge which bore him, his mate, the closed wheelhouse where a man was steering, shut up with the fear of being swept overboard, together with the whole thing in one great crash. Her middle structure was like a half-tide rock, a wash upon a coast. It was like an outlying rock, with the water boiling up, streaming over, pouring off, beating round, like a rock in the surf, to which shipwreck people cling before they let go. Only it rose, it sank, it rolled continuously, without respite and rest, like a rock that should have miraculously struck adrift from a coast and gone walloping upon the sea. The Nanshan was being looted by the storm with a senseless, destructive fury. Trysails torn out of the extra gaskets, double-lashed awnings blown away, bridge swept clean, weathercloths burst, rails twisted, Light screens smashed, and two of the boats had gone already. They had gone unheard and unseen, 
melting, as it were, in the shock and smother of the wave. It was only later, when upon the white flash of another high sea hurling itself amidships, Jukes had a vision of two pairs of davits, leaping black and empty out of the solid blackness, with one overhauled, fall flying, and an iron-bound block capering in the air, that he became aware of what had happened within about three yards of his back. He poked his head forward, groping for the ear of his commander. His lips touched it, big, fleshy, very wet. He cried in an agitated tone, "'Our boats are going now, sir!' And again he heard that voice, forced and ringing feebly, but with a penetrating effect of quietness in the enormous discord of noises, as if sent out from some remote spot of peace beyond the black wastes of the gale. Again he heard a man's voice, the frail and indomitable sound that can be made to carry an infinity of thought, resolution, and purpose, that shall be pronouncing confident words on the last day, when heaven's fall and justice is gone. Again he heard it, and it was crying to him, as if from very, very far, All right. He thought he had not managed to make himself understood. Our boats, I say boats, the boats, sir, two gone. The same voice within a foot of him, and yet so remote, yelled sensibly, Can't be helped. Captain MacWhir had never turned his face, but Jukes caught some more words on the wind. What can expect when hammering through such bound to leave something behind stands to reason. Watchfully, Jukes listened for more. No more came. This was all Captain MacWhir had to say, and Jukes could picture to himself rather than see the broad squat back before him. An impenetrable obscurity pressed down upon the ghostly glimmers of the sea. A dull conviction seized upon Jukes that there was nothing to be done. If the steering gear did not give way, if the immense volumes of water did not burst the deck in or smash one of the hatches, if the engines did not give up, if way could be kept on the ship against this terrific wind, and she did not bury herself in one of these awful seas of those white crests alone, topping high over her bows, he could now and then get a sickening glimpse. Then there was a chance of her coming out of it. Something within him seemed to turn over, bringing uppermost the feeling that the Nanshan was lost. She's done for, he said to himself with a surprising mental agitation, as though he had discovered an unexpected meaning in this thought. One of these things was bound to happen. Nothing could be prevented now, and nothing could be remedied. The men on board did not count, and the ship could not last. This weather was too impossible. Jukes felt an arm thrown heavily over his shoulders, and to this overture he responded with great intelligence by catching hold of his captain round the waist. They stood, clasped thus in the blind night, bracing each other against the wind, cheek to cheek and lip to ear, in the manner of two hulks lashed stem to stern together and Jukes heard the voice of his commander hardly any louder than before, but nearer as though, starting to march athwart the prodigious rush of the hurricane, it had approached him, bearing that strange effect of quietness like the serene glow of a halo. "'Do you know where the hands got to?' it asked, vigorous and evanescent at the same time, overcoming the strength of the wind, and swept away from Jukes instantly. Jukes didn't know. They were all on the bridge when the real force of the hurricane struck the ship. He had no idea where they had crawled to. Under the circumstances, they were nowhere, for all the use that could be made of them. Somehow, the captain's wish to know distressed Jukes. "'Want the hands, sir?' he cried apprehensively. "'Ought to know,' asserted Captain McWhir. "'Hold hard!' They held hard. An outburst of unchained fury— a vicious rush of the wind absolutely steadied the ship. She rocked only, quick and light like a child's cradle, for a terrific moment of suspense, while the whole atmosphere, as it seemed, streamed furiously past her, roaring away from the tenebrous earth. 
it suffocated them, and with eyes shut they tightened their grasp. What, from the magnitude of the shock, might have been a column of water running upright in the dark, butted against the ship, broke short and fell on her bridge, crushingly from on high with a dead burying weight. A flying fragment of that collapse, a mere splash, enveloped them in one swirl from their feet over their heads, filling violently their ears, mouths, and nostrils with salt water. It knocked out their legs, wrenched in haste at their arms, seized away swiftly under their chins, and opening their eyes they saw the piled-up masses of foam dashing to and fro amongst what looked like the fragments of a ship. She had given way, as if driven straight in. Their panting hearts yielded, too, before the tremendous blow, and all at once she sprang up again to her desperate plunging, as if trying to scramble out from under the ruins. The seas in the dark seemed to rush from all sides to keep her back where she might perish. There was hate in the way she was handled, and a ferocity in the blows that fell. She was like a living creature thrown to the rage of a mob, hustled terribly, struck at, borne up, flung down, leapt upon. Captain McQuirr and Jukes kept hold of each other, deafened by the noise, gagged by the wind, and the great physical tumult beating upon their bodies brought, like an unbridled display of passion, a profound trouble to their souls. One of those wild and appalling shrieks that are heard at times, passing mysteriously overhead in the steady roar of a hurricane, swooped as if borne on wings upon the ship, and Jukes tried to outscream it. "'Will she live through this?' the cry was wrenched out of his breast, and it was as unintentional as the birth of a thought in the head, and he heard nothing of it himself. It all became extinct at once, thought, intention, effort, and of his cry the inaudible vibration added to the tempest waves of the air. He expected nothing from it, nothing at all, for indeed what answer could be made? But after a while... He heard with amazement the frail and resisting voice in his ear, the dwarf sound unconquered in the giant tumult. She may. It was a dull yell, more difficult to seize than a whisper, and presently the voice returned again, half submerged in the vast crashes, like a ship battling against the waves of an ocean. Let's hope so, it cried, small, lonely, and unmoved a stranger to the visions of hope or fear, and it flickered into disconnected words. Ship. This. Never. Anyhow. For the best. Jukes gave it up. Then, as if it had come suddenly upon the one thing fitted to withstand the power of a storm, it seemed to gain force and firmness for the last broken shouts. Keep on hammering. Builders. Good men and chance it, engines, rout, good men. Captain McWhir removed his arm from Duke's shoulders, and thereby ceased to exist for his mate, so dark it was. Jukes, after a tense stiffening of every muscle, would let himself go limp all over. The gnawing of profound discomfort existed side by side with an incredible disposition to somnolence as though he had been buffeted and worried into drowsiness. The wind would get hold of his head and try to shake it off his shoulders. His clothes, full of water, were as heavy as lead, cold and dripping like an armor of melting ice. He shivered. It lasted a long time. And with his hands closed hard on his hold, he was letting himself sink slowly into the depth of bodily misery. His mind became concentrated upon himself in an aimless, idle way, and when something pushed lightly at the back of his knees, he nearly, as the saying is, jumped out of his skin. In the start forward, he bumped the back of Captain McWhir, who didn't move, and then a hand gripped his thigh. A lull had come, a menacing lull of the wind, the holding of a stormy breath, and he felt himself pawed all over. It was the boatswain. Jukes recognized these hands, so thick and enormous, that they seemed to belong to some new species of man. 
the boatswain had arrived on the bridge, crawling on all fours against the wind, and had found the chief mate's legs with the top of his head. Immediately he crouched and began to explore Duke's person upwards with prudent, apologetic touches, as became an inferior. He was an ill-favoured, undersized, gruff sailor of fifty, coarsely hairy, short-legged, long-armed, resembling an elderly ape. His strength was immense, and in his great lumpy paws bulging like brown boxing gloves on the end of furry forearms, the heaviest objects were handled like playthings. Apart from the grizzled pelt on his chest, the menacing demeanour and the hoarse voice, he had none of the classical attributes of his rating. His good nature almost amounted to imbecility. The men did what they liked with him, and he had not an ounce of initiative in his character, which was easy-going and talkative. For these reasons, Jukes disliked him. But Captain MacWhir, to Jukes' scornful disgust, seemed to regard him as a first-rate petty officer. He pulled himself up by Jukes' coat, taking that liberty with the greatest moderation, and only so far as it was forced upon him by the hurricane. "'What is it, Boston? what is it?' Jukes yelled impatiently. "'What could that fraud of a Boston want on the bridge?' The typhoon had got on Jukes' nerves. The husky bellowings of the other, though unintelligible, seemed to suggest a state of lively satisfaction. There could be no mistake. The old fool was pleased with something. The boatswain's other hand had found some other body, for in a changed tone he began to inquire, "'Is it you, sir? Is it you, sir?' The wind strangled his howls. "'Yes,' cried Captain MacWhir. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Typhoon this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Chant Typhoon by Joseph Conrad, Chapter 4 All that the boatswain, out of a superabundance of yells, could make clear to Captain McWhir was the bizarre intelligence that all them Chinamen in the fore tween deck have fetched away, sir. Jukes to Leward could hear these two shouting within six inches of his face, as you may hear on a still night half a mile away two men conversing across a field. He heard Captain McWhir's exasperated, What? What? and the strained pitch of the other's hoarseness. In a lump. Seen them myself. Awful sight, sir. Thought. Tell you. Jukes remained indifferent, as if rendered irresponsible by the force of the hurricane, which made the very thought of action utterly vain. Besides, being very young, he had found the occupation of keeping his heart completely steeled against the worst, so engrossing that he had come to feel an overpowering dislike towards any other form of activity whatever. He was not scared. He knew this because, firmly believing he would never see another sunrise, he remained calm in that belief. These are the moments of do-nothing heroics to which even good men surrender at times. Many officers of ships can no doubt recall a case in their experience when just such a trance of confounded stoicism would come all at once over a whole ship's company. Jukes, however, had no wide experience of men or storms. He conceived himself to be calm, inexorably calm. But, as a matter of fact, he was daunted. Not abjectly, but only so far as a decent man may, without becoming loathsome to himself. It was rather like a forced-on numbness of spirit, the long, long stress of a gale does it, the suspense of the interminably culminating catastrophe, and there is a bodily fatigue in the mere holding on to existence within the excessive tumult, a searching and insidious fatigue that 
penetrates deep into a man's breast to cast down and sadden his heart, which is incorrigible, and of all the gifts of the earth, even before life itself aspires to peace. Jukes was benumbed much more than he supposed. He held on, very wet, very cold, stiff in every limb, and in a momentary hallucination of swift visions, it is said that a drowning man thus reviews all his life. He beheld all sorts of memories altogether unconnected with his present situation. He remembered his father, for instance, a worthy businessman, who at an unfortunate crisis in his affairs went quietly to bed and died forthwith in a state of resignation. Jukes did not recall these circumstances, of course, but remaining otherwise unconcerned, he seemed to see distinctly the poor man's face. A certain game of nap played when quite a boy in Table Bay on board a ship, since lost with all hands. The thick eyebrows of his first skipper, and without any emotion, as he might years ago have walked listlessly into her room and found her sitting there with a book, he remembered his mother. Dead too now, the resolute woman, left badly off, who had been very firm in his bringing up. It could not have lasted more than a second, perhaps not so much. A heavy arm had fallen about his shoulders. Captain McWhirr's voice was speaking his name into his ear. Dukes! Dukes! He detected the tone of deep concern. The wind had thrown its weight on the ship, trying to pin her down amongst the seas. They made a clean breach over her, as over a deep swimming log, and the gathered weight of crashes menaced monstrously from afar. The breakers flung out of the night with a ghostly light on their crests, the light of sea foam that, in a ferocious boiling-up pale flash, showed upon the slender body of the ship, the toppling rush, the downfall, and the seething mad scurry of each wave. Never for a moment could she shake herself clear of the water. Dukes, rigid, perceived in her motion the ominous sign of haphazard floundering. She was no longer struggling intelligently. It was the beginning of the end, and the note of busy concern in Captain McWhirr's voice sickened him like an exhibition of blind and pernicious folly. The spell of the storm had fallen upon Dukes. He was penetrated by it, absorbed by it, he was rooted in it with a rigour of dumb attention. Captain McWhirr persisted in his cries, but the wind got between them like a solid wedge. He hung round Duke's neck as heavy as a millstone, and suddenly the sides of their heads knocked together. Jukes! Mr. Jukes, I say! He had to answer that voice that would not be silenced. He answered in the customary manner, Yes, sir. And directly his heart, corrupted by the storm that breeds a craving for peace, rebelled against the tyranny of training and command. Captain McWhirr had his mate's head fixed firm in the crook of his elbow and pressed it to his yelling lips mysteriously. Sometimes Dukes would break in, admonishing hastily, Look out, sir! or Captain McWhirr would bawl an earnest exhortation to HOLD HARD THERE, and the whole black universe seemed to reel together with the ship. They paused. She floated yet, and Captain McWhirr would resume his shouts. Says, whole lot, fetched away, ought to see, what's the matter? Directly the full force of the hurricane had struck the ship, every part of her deck became untenable, and the sailors, dazed and dismayed, took shelter in the port alleyway under the bridge. It had a door aft which they shut. It was very black, cold and dismal. At each heavy fling of the ship, they would groan all together in the dark, and tons of water could be heard scuttling about, as if trying to get at them from above. The boatswain had been keeping up a gruff talk, 
but a more unreasonable lot of men, he said afterwards, he had never been with. They were snug enough there out of harm's way, and not wanted to do anything either. And yet they did nothing but grumble and complain peevishly, like so many sick kids. Finally, one of them said that if there had been at least some light to see each other's noses by, it wouldn't be so bad. It was making him crazy, he declared, to lie there in the dark waiting for the blamed hooker to sink. Why don't you step outside then and be done with it at once? The boatswain turned on him. This called up a shout of execration. The boatswain found himself overwhelmed with reproaches of all sorts. They seemed to take it ill that a lamp was not instantly created for them out of nothing. They would whine after a light to get drowned by, anyhow. And though the unreason of their revilings was patent, since no one could hope to reach the lamp room which was forward, he became greatly distressed. He did not think it was decent of them to be nagging at him like this. He told them so, and was met by General Contumely. He sought refuge, therefore, in an embittered silence. At the same time, their grumbling and sighing and muttering worried him greatly. But by and by it occurred to him that there were six globe lamps hung in the tween deck, and that there could be no harm in depriving the coolies of one of them. The Nan Shan had an athwart ship's coal bunker which, being at times used as cargo space, communicated by an iron door with the fore tween deck. It was empty then, and its manhole was the foremost one in the alleyway. The boatswain could get in, therefore, without coming out on deck at all. But to his great surprise he found he could induce no one to help him in taking off the manhole cover. He groped for it all the same, but one of the crew lying in his way refused to budge. Why, I almost want to get you that blamed light you are crying for, he apostulated almost pitifully. Somebody told him to go and put his head in a bag. He regretted that he could not recognize the voice and that it was too dark to see, otherwise, as he said, he would have put a head on that son of a sea cook anyway, sink or swim. Nevertheless, he had made up his mind to show them he could get a light if he were to die for it. Through the violence of the ship's rolling, every movement was dangerous. To be lying down seemed labor enough. He nearly broke his neck dropping into the bunker. He fell on his back and was sent shooting helplessly from side to side in the dangerous company of a heavy iron bar, a coal trimmer slice probably, left down there by somebody. The thing made him as nervous as though it had been a wild beast. He could not see it, the inside of the bunker coated with coal dust being perfectly and impenetrably black but he heard it sliding and clattering and striking here and there, always in the neighbourhood of his head. It seemed to make an extraordinary noise too, to give heavy thumps as though it had been as big as a bridge girder. This was remarkable enough for him to notice while he was flung from port to starboard and back again, and clawing desperately the smooth sides of the bunker in the endeavour to stop himself. The door into the tween deck not fitting quite true, he saw a thread of dim light at the bottom. Being a sailor and a still active man, he did not want much of a chance to regain his feet, and as luck would have it, in scrambling up he put his hand on the iron slice, picking it up as he rose, otherwise he would have been afraid of the thing breaking his legs, or at least knocking him down again. At first he stood still. He felt unsafe in this darkness that seemed to make the ship's motion unfamiliar, unforeseen and difficult to counteract. He felt so much shaken for a moment that he dared not move for fear of taking charge again. He had no mind to get battered to pieces in that bunker. He had struck his head twice. He was dazed a little, 
he seemed to hear yet so plainly the clatter and bangs of the iron slice flying about his ears that he tightened his grip to prove to himself he had it there safely in his hand. He was vaguely amazed at the plainness with which down there he could hear the gale raging. Its howls and shrieks seemed to take on in the emptiness of the bunker something of the human character, of human rage and pain, being not vast but infinitely poignant. And there were, with every roll, thumps too, profound, ponderous thumps, as if a bulky object of five-ton weight or so had got play in the hold. But there was no such thing in the cargo. Something on deck? Impossible. Or alongside? Couldn't be. He thought all this quickly, clearly, competently, like a seaman, and in the end remained puzzled. This noise, though, came deadened from outside, together with the washing and pouring of water on deck above his head. Was it the wind? Must be. It made down there a row like the shouting of a big lot of crazed men. And he discovered in himself a desire for a light too, if only to get drowned by, and a nervous anxiety to get out of that bunker as quickly as possible. He pulled back the bolt. The heavy iron plate turned on its hinges, and it was as though he had opened the door to the sounds of the tempest. A gust of hoarse yelling met him, and the rushing of water overhead was covered by a tumult of strangled, throaty shrieks that produced an effect of desperate confusion. He straddled his legs the whole width of the doorway and stretched his neck, and at first he perceived only what he had come to seek. Six small yellow flames swinging violently on the great body of the dusk. It was stayed like the gallery of a mine with a row of staunchions in the middle and cross beams overhead, penetrating into the gloom ahead indefinitely. And to port there loomed, like the caving in of one of the sides, a bulky mass with a slanting outline the whole place with the shadows and the shapes, moved all the time. The boatswain glared, the ship lurched to starboard, and a great howl came from that mass that had the slant of fallen earth. Pieces of wood whizzed past. Planks, he thought, inexpressibly startled and flinging back his head. At his feet a man went sliding over, open-eyed, on his back, straining with uplifted arms for nothing. And another came bounding like a detached stone with his head between his legs, and his hands clenched, his pigtail whipped in the air. He made a grab at the boatswain's legs, and from his opened hand a bright white disc rolled against the boatswain's foot. He recognised a silver dollar and yelled at it with astonishment. With a precipitated sound of trampling and shuffling of bare feet, and with guttural cries, the mound of writhing bodies piled up to port, detached itself from the ship's side, and sliding, inert and struggling, shifted to starboard with a dull, brutal thud. The cries ceased. The boatswain heard a long moan through the roar and whistling of the wind. He saw an inextricable confusion of heads and shoulders, naked souls kicking upwards, fists raised, tumbling backs, legs, pigtails, faces. Good Lord, he cried, horrified, and banged to the iron door upon this vision. This was what he had come on the bridge to tell. He could not keep it to himself and on board ship there is only one man to whom it is worth while to unburden yourself. On his passage back the hands in the alleyway swore at him for a fool. Why didn't he bring that lamp? What the devil did the coolies matter to anybody? And when he came out, the extremity of the ship made what went on inside of her appear of little moment. At first he thought he had left the alleyway in the very moment of her sinking. The bridge ladders had been washed away, but an enormous sea filling the afterdeck floated him up. 
After that he had to lie on his stomach for some time, holding to a ring bolt, getting his breath now and then and swallowing salt water. He struggled farther on his hands and knees, too frightened and distracted to turn back. In this way he reached the after part of the wheelhouse. In that comparatively sheltered spot he found the second mate. The boatswain was pleasantly surprised, his impression being that everybody on deck must have been washed away a long time ago. He asked eagerly where the captain was. The second mate was lying low like a malignant little animal under a hedge. Captain, gone overboard after getting us into this mess. The mate too, for all he knew or cared. Another fool didn't matter. Everybody was going by and by. The boatswain crawled out again into the strength of the wind, not because he much expected to find anybody, he said, but just to get away from that man. He crawled out as outcasts go to face an inclement world, hence his great joy at finding Jukes and the captain. But what was going on in the tween deck was to him a minor matter at the time. Besides, it was difficult to make yourself heard. But he managed to convey the idea that the Chinaman had broken adrift together with their boxes, and that he had come up on purpose to report this. As to the hands, they were all right. Then appeased, he subsided on the deck in a sitting posture, hugging with his arms and legs the stand of the engine room telegraph, an iron casting as thick as a post. When that went, why he expected he would go too. He gave no more thought to the coolies. Captain McWhir had made Dukes understand that he wanted him to go down below to see. What am I to do then, sir? And the trembling of his whole wet body caused Duke's voice to sound like bleating. See first. Bosun says adrift. That bosun is a confounded fool, howled Dukes shakily. The absurdity of the demand made upon him revolted Dukes. He was as unwilling to go as if the moment he had left the deck, the ship was sure to sink. I must know. Can't leave. They'll settle, sir. Fight. Boson says they fight. Why can't have fighting or ship? Much rather keep you here. Case I should... Washed overboard myself. Stop it. Some way. You see. And tell me. Through engine room tube. Don't want you come up here. Too often. Dangerous moving about. Deck. Dukes held with his head in chancery had to listen to what seemed horrible suggestions. Don't want you get lost so long. Ship isn't route. Good man, ship may through this all right yet. All at once Dukes understood he would have to go. Do you think she may? he screamed. But the wind devoured the reply, out of which Dukes heard only the one word pronounced with great energy. Always! Captain McWhir releasing Dukes and bending over the boatswain yelled, Get back with the mate! Dukes only knew that the arm was gone off his shoulders. He was dismissed with his orders. To do what? He was exasperated into letting go his hold carelessly, and on the instant was blown away. It seemed to him that nothing could stop him from being blown right over the stern. He flung himself down hastily, 
and the boatswain who was following fell on him. Don't you get up yet, sir, cried the boatswain. No hurry. A sea swept over. Jukes understood the boatswain to splutter that the bridge ladders were gone. I'll lower you down, sir, by your hands, he screamed. He shouted also something about the smokestack being as likely to go overboard as not. Jukes thought it very possible, and imagined the fires out, the ship helpless. The boatswain by his side kept on yelling, What? What is it? Jukes cried distressfully. And the other repeated, What would my old woman say if she saw me now? In the alleyway where a lot of water had got in and splashed in the dark, the men were still as death, till Jukes stumbled against one of them and cursed him savagely for being in the way. Two or three voices then asked, eager and weak, Any chance for us, sir? What's the matter with you, fools? he said brutally. He felt as though he could throw himself down amongst them and never move any more. But they seemed cheered, and in the midst of obsequious warnings, Look out! Mind that manhole lid, sir! They lowered him into the bunker. The boatswain tumbled down after him, and as soon as he had picked himself up, he remarked, She would say, Serve you right, you old fool, for going to sea. The boatswain had some means, and made a point of alluding to them frequently. His wife, a fat woman, and two grown-up daughters, kept a greengrocer's shop in the east end of London. In the dark, Dukes, unsteady on his legs, listened to a faint thunderous patter. A deadened screaming went on steadily at his elbow, as it were, and from above the louder tumult of the storm descended upon these near sounds. His head swam. To him, too, in that bunker, the motion of the ship seemed novel and menacing, sapping his resolution as though he had never been afloat before. He had half a mind to scramble out again, but the remembrance of Captain McWhirr's voice made this impossible. His orders were to go and see. What was the good of it, he wanted to know. Enraged, he told himself he would see, of course, but the boatswain, staggering clumsily, warned him to be careful how he opened that door. There was a blamed fight going on, and Dukes, as if in great bodily pain, desired irritably to know what the devil they were fighting for. Dollars! Dollars, sir! All the rotten chests got burst open, blamed money skipping all over the place, and they are tumbling after it, head over heels, tearing and biting like anything. A regular little hell in there. Jukes convulsively opened the door. The short boatswain peered under his arm. One of the lamps had gone out, broken perhaps. Rancorous guttural cries burst loudly on their ears and a strange panting noise, the working of all these straining beasts. A hard blow hit the side of the ship, Water fell above with a stunning shock, and in the forefront of the gloom where the air was reddish and thick, Duke saw a head bang the deck violently, two thick calves waving on high, muscular arms twined round a naked body, a yellow face open-mouthed and with a set wild stare, look up and slide away. An empty chest clattered, turning over. A man fell head first with a jump as if lifted by a kick, and further off, indistinct, others screamed like a mass of rolling stones down a bank, thumping the deck with their feet and flourishing their arms wildly. The hatchway ladder was loaded with coolies swarming on it like bees on a branch. They hung on the steps in a crawling, stirring cluster, beating madly with their fists the underside of the battened hatch, and the headlong rush of the water above was heard in the intervals of their yelling. The ship heeled over more, and they began to drop off, first one, then two, then all the rest went away together, falling straight off with a great cry. Jukes was confounded. 
The boatswain, with gruff anxiety, begged him, Don't you go in there, sir. The whole place seemed to twist upon itself, jumping incessantly the while. And when the ship rose to a sea, Dukes fancied that all these men would be shot upon him in a body. He backed out, swung the door to, and with trembling hands pushed at the bolt. As soon as his mate had gone, Captain McWhir, left alone on the bridge, sidled and staggered as far as the wheelhouse. Its door being hinged forward, he had to fight the gale for admittance and when at last he managed to enter, it was with an instantaneous clatter and a bang, as though he had been fired through the wood. He stood within, holding on to the handle. The steering gear leaked steam, and in the confined space the glass of the binnacle made a shiny oval of light in a thin white fog. The wind howled, hummed, whistled, and with sudden booming gusts that rattled the doors and shutters in the vicious patter of sprays. Two coils of lead line and a small canvas bag hung on a long lanyard, swung wide off, and came back clinging to the bulkheads. The gratings underfoot were nearly afloat. With every sweeping blow of a sea, water squirted violently through the cracks all round the door and the man at the helm had flung down his cap, his coat, and stood propped against the gear casing in a striped cotton shirt open on his breast. The little brass wheel in his hands had the appearance of a bright and fragile toy. The cords of his neck stood hard and lean, a dark patch lay in the hollow of his throat, and his face was still and sunken as in death. Captain McWhir wiped his eyes. The sea that had nearly taken him overboard had, to his great annoyance, washed his sou'wester hat off his bald head. The fluffy fair hair, soaked and darkened, resembled a mean skein of cotton threads festooned round his bare skull. His face, glistening with sea water, had been made crimson with the wind and the sting of sprays. He looked as though he had come off sweating from before a furnace. You hear? he muttered heavily. The second mate had found his way into the wheelhouse some time before. He had fixed himself in a corner with his knees up, a fist pressed against each temple, and this attitude suggested rage, sorrow, resignation, surrender, with a sort of concentrated unforgiveness. He said mournfully and defiantly, Well, it's my watch below now, ain't it? The steam gear clattered, stopped, clattered again, and the helmsman's eyeballs seemed to project out of a hungry face as if the compass card behind the binnacle glass had been meat. God knows how long he had been left there to steer, as if forgotten by all his shipmates. The bells had not been struck, there had been no reliefs. The ship's routine had gone downwind, but he was trying to keep her head nor nor east. The rudder might have been gone for all he knew. The fires out, the engines broken down, the ship ready to roll over like a corpse. He was anxious not to get muddled and lose control of her head, because the compass card swung far both ways, wriggling on the pivot, and sometimes seemed to whirl right round. He suffered from mental stress. He was horribly afraid, also, of the wheelhouse going. Mountains of water kept on tumbling against it. When the ship took one of her desperate drives, the corners of his lips twitched. Captain McWhir looked up at the wheelhouse clock. Screwed to the bulkhead, it had a white face on which the black hands appeared to stand quite still. It was half-past one in the morning. Another day, he muttered to himself. The second mate heard him and lifting his head as one grieving amongst ruins. You won't see it break, he exclaimed. His wrists and his knees could be seen to shake violently. No, not by God, you won't. He took his face again between his fists. The body of the helmsman had moved slightly, but his head didn't budge on his neck. Like a stone head, 
fixed to look one way from a column, during a roll that all but took his booted legs from under him, and in the very stagger to save himself, Captain McWhir said austerely, Don't you pay any attention to what that man says. And then, with an indefinable change of tone, very grave, he added, He isn't on duty. The sailor said nothing. The hurricane boomed, shaking the little place, which seemed airtight, and the light of the binnacle flickered all the time. You haven't been relieved, Captain McWhir went on looking down. I want you to stick to the helm, though, as long as you can. You've got the hang of her. Another man coming here might make a mess of it. Wouldn't do. No child's play and the hands are probably busy with a job down below. Think you can? The steering gear leapt into an abrupt short clatter, stopped smouldering like an ember, and the still man with a motionless gaze burst out, as if all the passion in him had gone into his lips. By heaven, sir! I can steer forever if nobody talks to me! Oh, aye! All right. The captain lifted his eyes for the first time to the man. Hack it. And he seemed to dismiss the matter from his mind. He stooped to the engine room speaking tube, blew in and bent his head. Mr. Rout below answered, and at once Captain McWhir put his lips to the mouthpiece. With the uproar of the gale around him, he applied alternately his lips and his ear, and the engineer's voice mounted to him, harsh, and as if out of the heat of an engagement. One of the stokers was disabled. The others had given in. The second engineer and the donkey man were firing up. The third engineer was standing by the steam valve. The engines were being tended by hand. How was it above? Bad enough? It mostly rests with you, said Captain McWhir. Was the mate down there yet? No? Well, he would be presently. Would Mr. Rout let him talk through the speaking tube? Through the deck speaking tube, because he, the captain, was going out again on the bridge directly. There was some trouble amongst the Chinamen. They were fighting, it seemed. Couldn't allow fighting, anyhow. Mr. Rout had gone away and Captain McWhir could feel against his ear the pulsation of the engines like the beat of the ship's heart. Mr. Rout's voice down there shouted something distantly. The ship pitched headlong. The pulsation leaped with a hissing tumult and stopped dead. Captain McWhir's face was impassive, and his eyes were fixed aimlessly on the crouching shape of the second mate. Again Mr. Rout's voice cried out in the depths, and the pulsating beats recommenced with slow strokes growing swifter. Mr. Rout had returned to the tube. It doesn't matter much what they do, he said hastily, and then with irritation. She takes those dives as if she never meant to come up again. Awful sea, said the captain's voice from above. Don't let me drive her under barked Solomon Rout up the pipe. Dark and rain, can't see what's coming, uttered the voice. Must keep her moving. Enough to steer and chance it. It went on to state distinctly. I am doing as much as I dare. We are getting smashed up a good deal up here, proceeded the voice mildly. Doing fairly well, though. Of course, if the wheelhouse should go. Mr. Rout, bending an attentive ear, muttered peevishly something under his breath. But the deliberate voice up there became animated to ask, Duke's turn up yet? Then, after a short wait, I wish he would bear a hand. I want him to be done and come up here in case of anything. To look after the ship. I am all alone. The second mate's lost. What? shouted Mr. Rout into the engine room, taking his head away. Then up the tube he cried, 
gone overboard and clapped his ear to. Lost his nerve, the voice from above continued in a matter-of-fact tone. Damned awkward circumstance. Mr. Rout, listening with bowed neck, opened his eyes wide at this. However, he heard something like the sounds of a scuffle and broken exclamations coming down to him. He strained his hearing, and all the time Beale, the third engineer, with his arms uplifted, held between the palms of his hands the rim of a little black wheel projecting at the side of a big copper pipe. He seemed to be poising it above his head as though it were a correct attitude in some sort of game. To steady himself, he pressed his shoulder against the white bulkhead, one knee bent, and a sweat rag tucked in his belt hanging on his hip. His smooth cheek was begrimed and flushed, and the coal dust on his eyelids, like the black pencilling of a makeup, enhanced the liquid brilliance of the whites, giving to his youthful face something of a feminine, exotic, and fascinating aspect. When the ship pitched, he would, with hasty movements of his hands, screw hard at the little wheel. Gone crazy, began the captain's voice suddenly in the tube. Rushed at me, just now. Had to knock him down. This minute. You heard, Mr. Rout? The devil, muttered Mr. Rout. Look out, Beale. His shout rang out like the blast of a warning trumpet between the iron walls of the engine room. Painted white, they rose high into the dusk of the skylight, sloping like a roof, and the whole lofty space resembled the interior of a monument, divided by floors of iron grating. With lights flickering at different levels, and a mass of gloom lingering in the middle, within the columnar stir of machinery, under a motionless swelling of the cylinders. A loud and wild resonance, made up of all the noises of the hurricane, dwelt in the still warmth of the air. There was in it the smell of hot metal, of oil, and a slight mist of steam. The blows of the sea seemed to traverse it in an unringing, stunning shock from side to side. Gleams like pale long flames trembled upon the polish of metal. From the flooring below, the enormous crankheads emerged in their turns with a flash of brass and steel going over, while the connecting rods, big-jointed like skeleton limbs, seemed to thrust them down and pull them up again with an irresistible precision. And deep in the half-light, other rods dodged deliberately to and fro, crossheads nodded, Discs of metal rubbed smoothly against each other, slow and gentle, in a comingling of shadows and gleams. Sometimes all those powerful and unerring movements would slow down simultaneously, as if they had been the functions of a living organism, stricken suddenly by the blight of languor, and Mr. Rout's eyes would blaze darker in his long, sallow face. He was fighting this fight, in a pair of carpet slippers. A short, shiny jacket barely covered his loins, and his white wrists protruded far out of the tight sleeves, as though the emergency had added to his stature, had lengthened his limbs, augmented his pallor, hollowed his eyes. He moved, climbing high up, disappearing low down, with a restless, purposeful industry, and when he stood still, Holding the guard rail in front of the starting gear, he would keep glancing to the right, at the steam gauge, at the water gauge, fixed upon the white wall in the light of a swinging lamp. The mouths of two speaking tubes gaped stupidly at his elbow, and the dial of the engine room telegraph resembled a clock of large diameter, bearing on its face curt words instead of figures. The grouped letters stood out heavily black, around the pivot head of the indicator, emphatically symbolic of loud exclamations. Ahead, astern, slow, half, stand by, and the fat black hand pointed downwards to the word full, which, thus singled out, captured the eye as a sharp cry secures attention. The wood-encased bulk of the low-pressure cylinder, 
frowning portly from above, emitted a faint wheeze at every thrust, and except for that low hiss the engines worked their steel limbs headlong or slow with a silent determined smoothness. And all this, the white walls, the moving steel, the floor plates under Solomon Rout's feet, the floors of iron grating above his head, the dusk and the gleams uprose and sank continuously with one accord upon the harsh wash of the waves against the ship's side. The whole loftiness of the place, booming hollow to the great voice of the wind, swayed at the top like a tree, would go over bodily, as if borne down this way and that by the tremendous blasts. "'You've got to hurry up!' shouted Mr. Rout as soon as he saw Jukes appear in the stokehold doorway. Jukes' glance was wandering and tipsy. His red face was puffy, as though he had overslept himself. He had had an arduous road, and had travelled over it with immense vivacity, the agitation of his mind corresponding to the exertions of his body. He had rushed up out of the bunker, stumbling in the dark alleyway amongst a lot of bewildered men who, trod upon, asked, "'What's up, sir?' in awed mutters all around him. Down the stokehold ladder, missing as many iron rungs in his hurry, down into a place deep as a well, black as Tophet, tipping over back and forth like a seesaw. The water in the bilges thundered at each roll, and lumps of coal skipped to and fro from end to end, rattling like an avalanche of pebbles on a slope of iron. Somebody in there moaned with pain, and somebody else could be seen crouching over what seemed the prone body of a dead man. A lusty voice blasphemed, and the glow under each fire door was like a pool of flaming blood radiating quietly in a velvety blackness. A gust of wind struck upon the nape of Duke's neck, and next moment he felt it streaming about his wet ankles. The stoke-hold ventilators hummed. In front of the six fire doors, two wild figures stripped to the waist, staggered and stooped, wrestling with heavy shovels. Hello! Plenty of draught now! yelled the second engineer at once, as though he had been all the time looking out for dukes. The donkey man, a dapper little chap with a dazzling fair skin and a tiny gingery moustache, worked in a sort of mute transport. They were keeping a full head of steam and a profound rumbling as of an empty furniture van trotting over a bridge made a sustained bass to all the other noises of the place. "'Blowing off all the time!' went on yelling the second. With a sound as of a hundred scoured saucepans, the orifice of a ventilator spat upon his shoulder a sudden gush of seawater, and he volleyed a steam of curses upon all things on earth, including his own soul, ripping and raving, and all the time attending to his business. With a sharp clash of metal, the ardent pale glare of the fire opened upon his bullet head, showing his spluttering lips, his insolent face, and with another clang closed like the white-hot wink of an iron eye. "'Where's the blooming ship? Can you tell me, blast my eyes? Underwater or what? It's coming down here in tons. Are the condemned cows gone to Hades?' Hey, don't you know anything, you jolly sailor man, you? Jukes, after a bewildered moment, had been helped by a roll to dart through. And as soon as his eyes took in the comparative vastness, peace and brilliance of the engine room, the ship, settling her stern heavily in the water, sent him charging head down upon Mr. Rout. The chief's arm, long like a tentacle, and straightening as if worked by a spring, went out to meet him and deflected his rush into a spin towards the speaking tubes. At the same time, Mr. Rout repeated earnestly, "'You've got to hurry up, whatever it is!' Jukes yelled, "'Are you there, sir?' and listened. Nothing. Suddenly the roar of the wind fell straight into his ear, but presently a small voice shoved aside the shouting hurricane quietly. You, Jukes, well? Jukes was ready to talk. 
It was only time that seemed to be wanting. It was easy enough to account for everything. He could perfectly imagine the coolies battened down in the reeking tween deck, lying sick and scared between the rows of chests. Then one of those chests, or perhaps several at once breaking loose in a roll, knocking out others, sides splitting, lids flying open, and all these clumsy Chinamen rising up in a body to save their property. Afterwards every fling of the ship would hurl that trampling, yelling mob here and there, from side to side in a whirl of smashed wood, torn clothing, rolling dollars. A struggle once started, they would be unable to stop themselves. Nothing could stop them now except main force. It was a disaster. He had seen it, and that was all he could say. Some of them must be dead, he believed. The rest would go on fighting. He sent his words tripping over each other, crowding the narrow tube. They mounted as if into a silence of an enlightened comprehension dwelling alone up there with a storm. And Dukes wanted to be dismissed from the face of that odious trouble, intruding on the great need of the ship. End of chapter 4 Recording by Alan Chant in Tunbridge, Kent, England on the 11th of May 2007 www.sevenoaksprep.kent.sch.uk Chapter 5 of Typhoon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. Typhoon by Joseph Conrad. Chapter 5. He waited. Before his eyes the engines turned with slow labor, that in the moment of going off into a mad fling would stop dead at Mr. Rout's shout, Look out, Beale! They paused in an intelligent immobility, stilled in mid-stroke, a heavy crank arrested on the cant as if conscious of danger and the passage of time. Then, with a now then from the chief, and the sound of breath expelled through clenched teeth, they would accomplish the interrupted revolution and begin another. There was the prudent sagacity of wisdom and the deliberation of enormous strength in their movements. This was their work this patient coaxing of a distracted ship over the fury of the waves and into the very eye of the wind. At times Mr. Rout's chin would sink on his breast, and he watched them with knitted eyebrows as if lost in thought. The voice that kept the hurricane out of Jukes's ear began, "'Take the hands with you,' and left off unexpectedly. "'What could I do with them, sir?' A harsh, abrupt, imperious clang exploded suddenly. The three pairs of eyes flew up to the telegraph dial to see the hand jump from full to stop as if snatched by a devil. And then these three men in the engine room had the intimate sensation of a check upon the ship, of a strange shrinking, as if she had gathered herself for a desperate leap. "'Stop her!' bellowed Mr. Rout. Nobody, not even Captain McQuirr, who alone on deck had caught sight of a white line of foam coming on at such a height that he couldn't believe his eyes. Nobody was to know the steepness of that sea, and the awful depth of the hollow the hurricane had scooped out behind the running wall of water. It raced to meet the ship, and with a pause, as of girding the loins, the Nanshan lifted her bows and leaped. The flames in all the lamps sank, darkening the engine room, one went out. With a tearing crash and a swirling, raving tumult, tons of water fell upon the deck, as though the ship had darted under the foot of a cataract. Down there, they looked at each other, stunned. Swept from end to end, by God, bawled Jukes. She dipped into the hollow straight down, as if going over the edge of the world. The engine room toppled forward menacingly, like the inside of a tower nodding in an earthquake. An awful racket of iron things falling came from the stokehold. She hung on this appalling slant long enough for Beale to drop on his hands and knees and begin to crawl, as if he meant to fly on all fours out of the engine room, and for Mr. Rout to turn his head slowly, 
rigid, cavernous, with the lower jaw dropping. Jukes had shut his eyes, and his face in a moment became hopelessly blank and gentle, like the face of a blind man. At last she rose slowly, staggering as if she had to lift a mountain with her bows. Mr. Rout shut his mouth. Jukes blinked, and little Beale stood up hastily. "'Another one like this, and that's the last of her,' cried the chief. He and Jukes looked at each other, and the same thought came into their heads. "'The captain. Everything must have been swept away. Steering gear gone, ship like a log. All over directly.' "'Rush!' ejaculated Mr. Rout thickly, glaring with enlarged, doubtful eyes at Jukes, who answered him by an irresolute glance. The clang of the telegraph gong soothed them instantly. The black hand dropped in a flash from stop to full. "'Now then, Beale!' cried Mr. Rout. The steam hissed low. The piston rods slid in and out. Jukes put his ear to the tube. The voice was ready for him. It said, "'Pick up all the money. Bear a hand now. I'll want you up here.' And that was all. Sir, called up Dukes. There was no answer. He staggered away like a defeated man from the field of battle. He had got, in some way or other, a cut above his left eyebrow, a cut to the bone. He was not aware of it in the least. Quantities of the China Sea, large enough to break his neck for him, had gone over his head, had cleaned, washed, and salted the wound. It did not bleed, but only gaped red and this gash over the eye, his disheveled hair, the disorder of his clothes, gave him the aspect of a man worsted in a fight with fists. "'Got to pick up the dollars?' He appealed to Mr. Rout, smiling pitifully at random. "'What's that?' asked Mr. Rout wildly. "'Pick up—' "'I don't care.' Then, quivering in every muscle, but with an exaggeration of paternal tone, "'Go away now, for God's sake. You deck people will drive me silly.' There's that second mate been going for the old man. Don't you know? You fellows are going wrong for want of something to do. At these words, Jukes discovered in himself the beginnings of anger. Want of something to do, indeed. Full of hot scorn against the chief, he turned to go the way he had come. In the stokehold, the plump donkeyman toiled with his shovel mutely, as if his tongue had been cut out, but the second was carrying on like a noisy, undaunted maniac, who had preserved his skill in the art of stoking under a marine boiler. "'Hello, you wandering officer. Hey, can't you get some of your slush-slingers to wind up a few of them ashes? I'm getting choked with them here. Curse it. Hello. Hey, remember the articles? Sailors and firemen to assist each other. Hey, do you hear?' Jukes was climbing out frantically, and the other, lifting up his face after him, howled, "'Can't you speak? What are you poking about here for? What's your game, anyhow?' A frenzy possessed Jukes. By the time he was back among the men in the darkness of the alleyway, he felt ready to wring all their necks at the slightest sign of hanging back. The very thought of it exasperated him. He couldn't hang back, and they shouldn't. The impetuosity with which he came amongst them carried them along. They had already been excited and startled at all his comings and goings, by the fierceness and rapidity of his movements, and more felt than seen in his rushes he appeared formidable busied with matters of life and death that brooked no delay. At his first word he heard them drop into the bunker one after another, obediently, with heavy thumps. They were not clear as to what would have to be done. "'What is it? What is it?' they were asking each other. The bosun tried to explain. The sounds of a great scuffle surprised them, and the mighty shocks, reverberating awfully in the black bunker, kept them in mind of their danger." When the boatswain threw open the door, it seemed that an eddy of the hurricane, stealing through the iron sides of the ship, had set all these bodies whirling like dust. There came to them a confused uproar, a tempestuous tumult, a fierce mutter, gusts of screams dying away, and the tramping of feet mingling with the blows of the sea. For a moment they glared amazed, blocking the doorway. Jukes pushed through them brutally. He said nothing, and simply darted in. Another lot of coolies on the ladder, struggling suicidally to break through the battened hatch to a swamped deck, fell off as before, and he disappeared under them like a man overtaken by a landslide. The boatswain yelled excitedly, "'Come along, get the mate out. He'll be trampled to death. Come on!' They charged in, stamping on breasts, on fingers, on faces, catching their feet in heaps of clothing, kicking broken wood— but before they could get hold of him, Jukes emerged waist-deep in a multitude of clawing hands. In the instant he had been lost to view, all the buttons of his jacket had gone. 
Its back had got split up to the collar. His waistcoat had been torn open. The central struggling mass of Chinamen went over to the roll, dark, indistinct, helpless, with a wild gleam of many eyes in the dim light of the lamps. "'Leave me alone, damn you! I'm all right!' squeaked Jukes. "'Drive them forward. Watch your chance when she pitches. Forward with them. Drive them against the bulkhead. Jam them up!' The rush of the sailors into the seething tween deck was like a splash of cold water into a boiling cauldron. The commotion sank for a moment. The bulk of Chinamen were locked in such a compact scrimmage that, linking their arms and aided by an appalling dive of the ship, the seamen sent it forward in one great shove like a solid block. Behind their backs, small clusters and loose bodies tumbled from side to side. The boson performed prodigious feats of strength. With his long arms open and each great paw clutching at a stanchion, he stopped the rush of seven entwined Chinamen rolling like a boulder. His joints cracked, he said, Ha! and they flew apart. But the carpenter showed the greater intelligence. Without saying a word to anybody, he went back into the alleyway to fetch several coils of cargo gear he had seen there, chain and rope. With these, lifelines were rigged. There was really no resistance. The struggle, however it began, had turned into a scramble of blind panic. If the coolies had started up after their scattered dollars, they were by that time fighting only for their footing. They took each other by the throat merely to save themselves from being hurled about. Whoever got a hold anywhere would kick at the others who caught at his legs and hung on, till a roll sent them flying together across the deck. The coming of the white devils was a terror. Had they come to kill? The individuals torn out of the ruck became very limp in the seamen's hands. Some, dragged aside by the heels, were passive like dead bodies with open, fixed eyes. Here and there a coolie would fall on his knees as if begging for mercy. Several, whom the excess of fear made unruly, were hit with hard fists between the eyes and cowered. While those who were hurt submitted to rough handling, blinking rapidly without a plaint. Faces streamed with blood. There were raw places on the shaven heads, scratches, bruises, torn wounds, gashes. The broken porcelain out of the chests was mostly responsible for the latter. Here and there a Chinaman, wild-eyed, with his tail unplated, nursed a bleeding soul. They had been ranged closely, after having been shaken into submission, cuffed a little to allay excitement, addressed in gruff words of encouragement that sounded like promises of evil. They sat on the deck in ghastly drooping rows, and at the end the carpenter, with two hands to help him, moved busily from place to place, setting taut and hitching the lifelines. The boatswain, with one leg and one arm embracing a stanchion, struggled with a lamp pressed to his breast, trying to get a light, and growling all the time like an industrious gorilla. The figures of seamen stooped repeatedly, with the movements of gleaners, and everything was being flung into the bunker. Clothing, smashed wood, broken china, and the dollars, too, gathered up in men's jackets. Now and then a sailor would stagger towards the doorway with his arms full of rubbish, and dolorous slanting eyes followed his movements. With every roll of the ship, the long rows of sitting celestials would sway brokenly forward, and her headlong dives knocked together the line of shaven poles from end to end. When the wash of water rolling on the deck died away for a moment, it seemed to Jukes, yet quivering from his exertions, that in his mad struggle down there he had overcome the wind somehow. That a silence had fallen upon the ship, a silence in which the sea struck thunderously at her sides. Everything had been cleared out of the tween deck, all the wreckage, as the men said. They stood erect and tottering above the level of heads and drooping shoulders. Here and there a coolie sobbed for his breath. Where the high light fell, Jukes could see the salient ribs of one, the yellow, wistful face of another, bowed necks, or would meet a dull stare directed at his face. He was amazed that there had been no corpses, but the lot of them seemed at their last gasp, and they appeared to him more pitiful than if they had been all dead. Suddenly one of the coolies began to speak. The light came and went on his lean, straining face. He threw up his head like a baying hound. From the bunker came the sounds of knocking and the tinkle of some dollars rolling loose. He stretched out his arm, his mouth yawned black, and the incomprehensible guttural hooting sounds that did not seem to belong to a human language penetrated Jukes with a strange emotion, as if a brute had tried to be eloquent. 
two more started mouthing what seemed to Jukes fierce denunciations. The others stirred with grunts and growls. Jukes ordered the hands out of the tween decks hurriedly. He left last himself, backing through the door, while the grunts rose to a loud murmur and hands were extended after him as after a malefactor. The bosun shot the bolt and remarked uneasily, "'Seems as if the wind had dropped, sir.' The seamen were glad to get back into the alleyway. Secretly, each of them thought that at the last moment he could rush out on deck, and that was a comfort. There is something horribly repugnant in the idea of being drowned under a deck. Now they had done with the Chinamen, they again became conscious of the ship's position. Jukes, on coming out of the alleyway, found himself up to the neck in the noisy water. He gained the bridge, and discovered he could detect obscure shapes as if his sight had become preternaturally acute. He saw faint outlines. They recalled not the familiar aspect of the Nanshan, but something remembered. An old dismantled steamer he had seen years ago rotting on a mudbank. She recalled that wreck. There was no wind, not a breath, except the faint currents created by the lurches of the ship. The smoke tossed out of the funnel was settling down upon her deck. He breathed it as he passed forward. He felt the deliberate throb of the engines, and heard small sounds that seemed to have survived the great uproar, the knocking of broken fittings, the rapid tumbling of some piece of wreckage on the bridge. He perceived dimly the squat shape of his captain holding on to a twisted bridge rail, motionless and swaying as if rooted to the planks. The unexpected stillness of the air oppressed Jukes. "'We've done it, sir,' he gasped. "'Thought you would,' said Captain McQuirr. "'Did you?' murmured Jukes to himself. "'Wind fell all at once,' went on the captain. Jukes burst out, "'If you think it was an easy job!' But his captain, clinging to the rail, paid no attention. "'According to the books, the worst is not over yet. "'If most of them hadn't been half dead with seasickness and fright, "'not one of us would have come out of that tween-deck alive,' said Jukes. "'Had to do what's fair by them,' mumbled McQuirr stolidly. "'You don't find everything in books.' "'Why, I believe they would have risen on us if I hadn't ordered the hands out of that pretty quick,' continued Jukes with warmth. After the whisper of their shouts, their ordinary tones so distinct rang out very loud to their ears in the amazing stillness of the air. It seemed to them they were talking in a dark and echoing vault. Through a jagged aperture in the dome of clouds the light of a few stars fell upon the black sea, rising and falling confusedly. Sometimes the head of a watery cone would topple on board and mingle with the rolling flurry of foam on the swamp deck, and the Nanshan wallowed heavily at the bottom of a circular cistern of clouds. This ring of dense vapors, gyrating madly round the calm of the center, encompassed the ship like a motionless and unbroken wall of an aspect inconceivably sinister. Within, the sea, as if agitated by an internal commotion, leaped in peaked mounds that jostled each other, slapping heavily against her sides, and a low moaning sound, the infinite plaint of the storm's fury, came from beyond the limits of the menacing calm. Captain McQuirr remained silent, and Jukes's ready ear caught suddenly the faint, long-drawn roar of some immense wave rushing unseen under that thick blackness, which made the appalling boundary of his vision. Of course, he started resentfully. They thought we had caught it the chance to plunder them. Of course. You said pick up the money. Easier said than done. They couldn't tell what was in our heads. We came in smash right into the middle of them. Had to do it by a rush. As long as it's done, mumbled the captain, without attempting to look at Jukes. Had to do what's fair. We shall find yet there's the devil to pay when this is over, said Jukes, feeling very sore. Let them only recover a bit and you'll see. They will fly at our throats, sir. Don't forget, she isn't a British ship now. These brutes know it well, too. Damn Siamese flag. We're on board all the same, remarked Captain McQuirr. The trouble's not over yet, insisted Jukes prophetically, reeling and catching on. She's a wreck, he added faintly. The trouble's not over yet, assented Captain McQuirr, half aloud. Look out for her a minute. Are you going off deck, sir? asked Jukes, hurriedly, as if the storm were sure to pounce upon him as soon as he had been left alone with the ship. He watched her, battered and solitary, laboring heavily in a wild scene of mountainous black waters lit by the gleams of distant worlds. She moved slowly, 
breathing into the still core of the hurricane the excess of her strength in a white cloud of steam, and the deep-toned vibration of the escape was like the defiant trumpeting of a living creature of the sea, impatient for the renewal of the contest. It ceased suddenly. The still air moaned. Above Jukes's head a few stars shone into a pit of black vapors. The inky edge of the cloud disk frowned upon the ship under the patch of glittering sky. The stars, too, seemed to look at her intently, as if for the last time, and the cluster of their splendor sat like a diadem on a lowering brow. Captain McQuirr had gone into the chart room. There was no light there, but he could feel the disorder of that place where he used to live tidily. His armchair was upset. The books had tumbled out on the floor. He scrunched a piece of glass under his boot. He groped for the matches, and found a box on a shelf with a deep ledge. He struck one, and puckering the corners of his eyes, held out the little flame towards the barometer, whose glittering top of glass and metals nodded at him continuously. It stood very low, incredibly low, so low that Captain McQuirk grunted. The match went out, and hurriedly he extracted another with thick, stiff fingers. Again a little flame flared up before the nodding glass and metal of the top. His eyes looked at it, narrowed with attention, as if expecting an imperceptible sign. With his grave face, he resembled a booted and misshapen pagan burning incense before the oracle of a joss. There was no mistake. It was the lowest reading he had ever seen in his life. Captain McQuirr emitted a low whistle. He forgot himself till the flame diminished to a blue spark, burnt his fingers, and vanished. Perhaps something had gone wrong with the thing. There was an aneroid glass screwed above the couch. He turned that way, struck another match, and discovered the white face of the other instrument looking at him from the bulkhead, meaningly, not to be gainsaid, as though the wisdom of men were made unerring by the indifference of matter. There was no room for doubt now. Captain McQuirp shot at it and threw the match down. The worst was to come then, and if the books were right, this worst would be very bad. The experience of the last six hours had enlarged his conception of what heavy weather could be like. It'll be terrific, he pronounced mentally. He had not consciously looked at anything by the light of the matches except at the barometer, and yet somehow he had seen that his water bottle and the two tumblers had been flung out of their stand. It seemed to give him a more intimate knowledge of the tossing the storm had gone through. I wouldn't have believed it, he thought. And his table had been cleared, too. His rulers, his pencils, the inkstand, all the things that had their safe appointed places. They were gone, as if a mischievous hand had plucked them out one by one and flung them on the wet floor. The hurricane had broken in upon the orderly arrangements of his privacy. This had never happened before, and the feeling of dismay reached the very seat of his composure. And the worst was to come yet. He was glad the trouble in the tween deck had been discovered in time. If the ship had to go after all, then at least she wouldn't be going to the bottom with a lot of people in her fighting teeth and claw. That would have been odious. And in that feeling there was a humane intention and a vague sense of the fitness of things. These instantaneous thoughts were yet in their essence heavy and slow, partaking of the nature of the man. He extended his hand to put back the matchbox in its corner of the shelf. There were always matches there, by his order. The steward had his instructions impressed upon him long before. A box, just there, see? Not so very full. Where I can put my hand on it, steward. Might want a light in a hurry. Can't tell on board ship what you might want in a hurry. Mine now. And, of course, on his side, he would be careful to put it back in its place scrupulously. He did so now. But before he removed his hand, it occurred to him that perhaps he would never have occasion to use that box any more. The vividness of the thought checked him, and for an infinitesimal fraction of a second his fingers closed again on the small object, as though it had been the symbol of all those little habits that chain us to the weary round of life. He released it at last, and letting himself fall on the settee, listened for the first sounds of returning wind. Not yet. He heard only the wash of water, the heavy splashes the dull shocks of the confused seas boarding his ship from all sides. She would never have a chance to clear her decks. But the quietude of the air was startlingly tense and unsafe, 
like a slender hair holding a sword suspended over his head. By this awful pause the storm penetrated the defenses of the man and unsealed his lips. He spoke out in the solitude and the pitch darkness of the cabin, as if addressing another being awakened within his breast. I shouldn't like to lose her, he said, half aloud. He sat unseen, apart from the sea, from his ship, isolated, as if withdrawn from the very current of his own existence, where such freaks as talking to himself surely had no place. His palms reposed on his knees. He bowed his short neck and puffed heavily, surrendering to a strange sensation of weariness he was not enlightened enough to recognize for the fatigue of mental stress. From where he sat he could reach the door of a washstand locker. There should have been a towel there. There was. Good. He took it out, wiped his face, and afterwards went on rubbing his wet head. He toweled himself with energy in the dark, and then remained motionless with the towel on his knees. A moment passed, of a stillness so profound that no one could have guessed there was a man sitting in that cabin. Then a murmur arose. She may come out of it yet. When Captain McQuirr came out on deck, which he did brusquely, as though he had suddenly become conscious of having stayed away too long, the calm had lasted already more than fifteen minutes, long enough to make itself intolerable even to his imagination. Jukes, motionless on the fore part of the bridge, began to speak at once. His voice, blank and forced as though he were talking through hard-set teeth, seemed to flow away on all sides into the darkness, deepening again upon the sea. I had the wheel relieved. Hackett began to sing out that he was done. He's lying in there alongside the steering gear with a face like death. At first I couldn't get anybody to crawl out and relieve the poor devil. That bossum's worse than no good, I always said. Thought I would have to go myself and haul one of them out by the neck. Ah, oh, well, muttered the captain. He stood watchful by Jukes's side. The second mate's in there, too, holding his head. Is he hurt, sir? No, crazy, said Captain McQuirr, curtly. Looks as if he had a tumble, though. I had to give him a push, explained the captain. Jukes gave an impatient sigh. It will come on very sudden, said Captain McQuirr. And from over there, I fancy. God only knows, though. These books are only good to muddle your head and make you jumpy. It will be bad, and there's an end. If we only can steam her round in time to meet it. A minute passed. Some of the stars winked rapidly and vanished. You left them pretty safe, began the captain abruptly, as though the silence were unbearable. Are you thinking of the coolies, sir? I rigged lifelines all ways across that tween deck. Did you? Good idea, Mr. Jukes. I didn't think you cared to know, said Jukes. The lurching of the ship cut his speech as though somebody had been jerking him around while he talked. How I got on with that infernal job. We did it, and it may not matter in the end. Had to do what's fair, for all. They are only Chinamen. Give them the same chance with ourselves. Oh, hang it all, she isn't lost yet. Bad enough to be shoved below in a gale. That's what I thought when you gave me the job, sir, interjected Jukes moodily. Without being battered to pieces, pursued Captain McQuirr with rising vehemence. Couldn't let that go on in my ship if I knew she hadn't five minutes to live. Couldn't bear it, Mr. Jukes. A hollow, echoing noise like that of a shout rolling in a rocky chasm approached the ship and went away again. The last star, blurred, enlarged, as if returning to the fiery mist of its beginning, struggled with the colossal depth of blackness hanging over the ship, and went out. "'Now for it,' muttered Captain McQuirr. "'Mr. Jukes. Here, sir.' The two men were growing indistinct to each other. "'We must trust her to go through it and come out on the other side. That's plain and straight. There's no room for Captain Wilson's storm strategy here.' "'No, sir.' She will be smothered and swept again for hours, mumbled the captain. There's not much left by this time above deck for the sea to take away, unless you or me. Both, sir, whispered Jukes, breathlessly. We're always meeting trouble halfway, Jukes, Captain McQuirr remonstrated quaintly. Though it's a fact that the second mate is no good. Do you hear, Mr. Jukes? You would be left alone if— Captain McQuirr interrupted himself, and Jukes, glancing on all sides— remained silent. 
Don't you be put out by anything, the captain continued, mumbling rather fast. Keep her facing it. They may say what they like, but the heaviest seas run with the wind. Facing it. Always facing it. That's the way to get through. You're a young sailor. Face it. That's enough for any man. Keep a cool head. Yes, sir, said Jukes, with a flutter of the heart. In the next few seconds, the captain spoke to the engine room and got an answer. For some reason, Jukes experienced an access of confidence, a sensation that came from outside like a warm breath and made him feel equal to every demand. The distant muttering of the darkness stole into his ears. He noted it, unmoved, out of that sudden belief in himself, as a man safe in a shirt of mail would watch a point. The ship labored without intermission amongst the black hills of water, paying with this hard tumbling the price of her life. She rumbled in her depths, shaking a white plummet of steam into the night, and Jukes's thoughts skimmed like a bird through the engine room, where Mr. Rout, good man, was ready. When the rumbling ceased, it seemed to him that there was a pause of every sound, a dead pause, in which Captain McWhir's voice rang out startlingly. "'What's that? A puff of wind?' It spoke much louder than Jukes had ever heard it before. "'On the bow, that's right. She may come out of it yet.' The mutter of the winds drew near apace. In the forefront could be distinguished a drowsy waking plaint passing on, and far off the growth of a multiple clamor, marching and expanding. There was the throb as of many drums in it, a vicious rushing note, and like the chant of a tramping multitude. Jukes could no longer see his captain distinctly. The darkness was absolutely piling itself upon the ship. At most he made out movements a hint of elbows spread out, of a head thrown up. Captain McQuirr was trying to do up the top button of his oilskin coat with unwanted haste. The hurricane, with its power to madden the seas, to sink ships, to uproot trees, to overturn strong walls and dash the very birds of the air to the ground, had found this taciturn man in its path, and doing its utmost, had managed to wring out a few words. Before the renewed wrath of winds swooped on his ship, Captain McWhir was moved to declare in a tone of vexation, as it were, I wouldn't like to lose her. He was spared that annoyance. End of chapter 5、Chapter、Six of Typhoon by Joseph Conrad This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On a bright sunny day, with the breeze chasing her smoke far ahead, the Nanshan came to Fu Chao. Her arrival was at once noticed on shore, and the seamen in harbor said, Look, look at that steamer. What's that? Siamese, isn't she? Just look at her. She seemed indeed to have been used as a running target for the secondary batteries of a cruiser. A hail of minor shells could not have given her upper works more broken, torn, and devastated aspect. She had about her the worn, weary air of ships coming from far ends of the world, and indeed with truth, for in her short passage she had been very, very far. Sighting, verily, even the coast of the great beyond, whence no ship ever returns to give up her crew to the dust of the earth. She was encrusted and gray with salt to the trucks of her mast and to the tops of her funnel. As though, as some facetious seaman said, the crowd on board had fished her out somewhere from the bottom of the sea and brought her in here for salvage. And further, excited by the felicity of his own wit, He offered to give five pounds for her, as she stands. Before she had been quite an hour at rest, a meager little man with a red tipped nose and a face cast in an angry mold landed from a sampan on the quay of the foreign concession and incontinently turned to shake his fist at her. A tall individual with legs much too thin for a rotund stomach and with watery eyes strolled up and remarked, Just left her, eh? Quick work. He wore a soiled suit of blue flannel with a pair of dirty, cricketing shoes. A dingy gray mustache drooped from his lip, and daylight could be seen in two places between the rim and the crown of his hat. 
Hello, what are you doing here? asked the second mate of the Nanshan, shaking hands hurriedly. Standing by for a job, chance worth taking. Got a quiet hint, explained the man with the broken hat, in jerky, apathetic wheezes. The second shook his fist at the Nanshan. There's a fellow there that ain't fit to have the command of a scow, he declared, quivering with passion, while the other looked about listlessly. Is there? But he caught sight on the quay of a heavy seaman's chest, painted brown under a fringed sailcloth cover and lashed with new manila line. He eyed it with awakened interest. I would talk and raise trouble if it wasn't for that damn Siamese flag. Nobody to go to, or I would make it hot for him. The fraud. Told his chief engineer, that's another fraud for you, I lost my nerve. The greatest lot of ignorant fools that ever sailed the seas. No, you can't think. Got your money all right? inquired his seedy acquaintance suddenly. Yes, paid me off on board. Raged the second mate. Get your breakfast on shore, says he. Mean skunk, commented the tall man vaguely and passed his tongue on his lips. What about having a drink of some sort? He struck me, hissed the second mate. No, struck. You don't say. The man in blue began to bustle about sympathetically. Can't possibly talk here. I want to know all about it. Struck, eh? Let's get a fellow to carry your chest. I know a quiet place where they have some bottled beer. Mr. Jukes, who had been scanning the shore through a pair of glasses, informed the chief engineer afterwards that our late second mate hasn't been long in finding a friend, a chap looking uncommonly like a bummer. I saw them walk away together from the quay. The hammering and banging of the needful repairs did not disturb Captain McWhirr. The steward found in the letter he wrote in a tidy chart room passages of such absorbing interest that twice he was nearly caught in the act. But Mrs. McWhirr, in the drawing room of the forty-pound house, stifled a yawn, perhaps out of self-respect, for she was alone. She reclined in a plush-bottomed and gilt hammock chair near a tiled fireplace with Japanese fans on the mantel and a glow of coals in the grate. Lifting her hands, she glanced wearily here and there into the many pages. It was not her fault they were so prosy, so completely uninteresting, from my darling wife at the beginning to your loving husband at the end. She couldn't be really expected to understand all these ship affairs. She was glad, of course, to hear from him, but she had never asked herself why precisely. They are called typhoons. The mate did not seem to like it. Not in books. Couldn't think of letting it go on. The paper rustled sharply. A calm that lasted more than twenty minutes, she read perfunctorily. And the next words, her thoughtless eyes caught on the top of another page, were, See you and the children again. She had a movement of impatience. He was always thinking of coming home. He had never had such a good salary before. What was the matter now? It did not occur to her to turn back over leaf to look. She would have found it recorded there that between 4 and 6 a.m. on December 25th, Captain McWhirr did actually think that his ship could not possibly live another hour in such a sea, and that he would never see his wife and children again. Nobody was to know this. His letters got mislaid so quickly. Nobody, whatever, but the steward, who had been greatly impressed by that disclosure. So much so that he tried to give the cook some idea of the narrow squeak we all had by saying solemnly, the old man himself had a damn poor opinion of our chance. How do you know, asked contemptuously the cook, an old soldier. He hasn't told you, maybe. Well, he did give me a hint to that effect, the steward brazened it out. Get along with you. He'll be coming to tell me next, jeered the old cook over his shoulder. Mrs. McWhirr glanced farther on the alert. Do what's fair, miserable objects, only three with a broken leg each in one. Thought had better keep the matter quiet, hope to have done the fair thing. She let fall her hands. No, there was nothing more about coming home. Must have been merely expressing a pious wish. Mrs. McWhirr's mind was set at ease in a black marble clock priced by the local jeweler at three pounds, eighteen shillings, six pence had a discreet stealthy tick. The door flew open and a girl in the long-legged, short-frocked period of existence flung into the room.
A lot of colorless, rather lanky hair was scattered over her shoulders. Seeing her mother, she stood still and directed her pale, prying eyes upon the letter. From father, murmured Mrs. McWhirr. What have you done with your ribbon? The girl put her hands up to her head and pouted. He's well, continued Mrs. McWhirr languidly. At least I think so. He never says. She had a little laugh. The girl's face expressed a wandering indifference, and Mrs. McWhirr surveyed her with a fond pride. Go and get your hat, she said after a while. I'm going out to do some shopping. There's a sale at Linham's. Oh, how jolly, uttered the child impressively, in unexpectedly grave, vibrating tones, and bounded out of the room. It was a fine afternoon with grey sky and dry sidewalks. Outside the drapers, Mrs. McWhirr smiled upon a woman in a black mantle of generous proportions, armoured in jet and crowned with flowers, blooming falsely above a bilious, matronly countenance. They broke into a swift little babble of greetings and exclamations, both together, very hurried as if the street were ready to yawn open and swallow all that pleasure before it could be expressed. Behind them the high glass doors were kept on the swing. People couldn't pass. Men stood aside waiting patiently, and Lydia was absorbed in poking the end of her parasol between the stone flags. Mrs. McMurrer talked rapidly. Thank you very much. He's not coming home yet. Of course, it's very sad to have him away, but it's such a comfort to know he keeps so well. Mrs. McBoer drew breath. The climate there agrees with him, she added beamingly, as if poor McWhirr had been away touring in China for the sake of his health. Neither was the chief engineer coming home yet. Mr. Rout knew too well the value of a good billet. Solomon says wonders will never cease, cried Mrs. Rout, joyously at the old lady in her armchair by the fire. Mr. Rout's mother moved slightly, her withered hands lying in the black half-mittens on her lap. The eyes of the engineer's wife fairly danced on the paper. That captain of the ship he is in, a rather simple man, you remember, mother, has done something rather clever, Solomon says. Yes, my dear said the old woman meekly, sitting with bowed silvery head, and that air of inward stillness characteristic of very old people who seem lost in watching the last flickers of life. I think I remember. Solomon Rout, old Saul, Father Saul, the chief Rout good man, Mr. Rout, the condescending and paternal friend of youth, had been the baby of her many children, all dead by this time, and she remembered him best as a boy of ten, long before he went away to serve his apprenticeship in some great engineering works in the north. She had seen so little of him since. She had gone through so many years that she had now to retrace her steps very far back to recognize him plainly in the mist of time. Sometimes it seemed that her daughter-in-law was talking of some strange man. Mrs. Rout, Jr. was disappointed. Hmm. She turned the page. How provoking. He doesn't say what it is. Says I couldn't understand how much there was in it. Fancy. What could it be so very clever? What a wretched man not to tell us. She read on without further remark soberly and at last sat looking into the fire. The chief wrote just a word or two of the typhoon. But something had moved him to express an increased longing for the companionship of the jolly woman. If it hadn't been that mother must be looked after, I would send you your passage money today. You could set up a small house out here. I would have a chance to see you sometimes then. We are not growing younger. He's well, mother, sighed Mrs. Rout, rousing herself. He always was a strong, healthy boy, said the old woman placidly. But Mrs. Jukes' account was really animated and very full. His friend in the Western Ocean trade imparted it freely to the other officers of his liner. A chap I know writes to me about an extraordinary affair that happened on board his ship in that typhoon. You know, that we read of in the papers two months ago. It's the funniest thing. Just see for yourself what he says. I'll show you his letter. There were phrases in it calculated to give the impression of light-hearted, indomitable resolution. Jukes had written them in good faith, for he felt thus when he wrote. He described with lurid effects the scenes of the tween deck. It struck me in a flash that those confounded Chinamen couldn't tell we weren't a desperate kind of robbers. To 
isn't good to part the Chinaman from his money if he is the stronger party. We need to have been desperate indeed to go thieving in such weather, but what could these beggars know of us? So without thinking of it twice, I got the hands away in a jiffy. Our work was done, that the old man had set his heart on. We cleared out without staying to inquire how they felt. I am convinced that if they had not been so unmercifully shaken and afraid, each individual one of them, to stand up, we would have been torn to pieces. Oh, it was pretty complete, I can tell you. And you may run to and fro across the pond to the end of time before you find yourself with such a job on your hands. After this he alluded professionally to the damage done to the ship and went on thus. It was when the weather quieted down that the situation became confoundedly delicate. It wasn't made any better up by us having been lately transferred to the Siamese flag, though the skipper can't see that it makes any difference. As long as we're on board, he says, there are feelings that this man simply hasn't got, and there's an end of it. You might just as well try to make a bedpost understand, but apart from this, it is an infernally lonely state for a ship to be going about the China seas with no proper consuls, not even a gunboat of her own anywhere, nor a body to go to in case of some trouble. My notion was to keep these johnnies under hatches for another fifteen hours or so, as we weren't much farther than that from Fan Chao. We would find there most likely some sort of man of war, and once under her guns we were safe enough, for surely any skipper of a man of war, English, French, or Dutch, would see white men through as far as row on board goes. We could get rid of them and their money afterwards by delivering them to their Mandarin or Tao Te, or whatever they call these chaps in goggles you see being carried about in sedan chairs through their stinking streets. The old man wouldn't see it somehow. He wanted to keep the matter quiet. He got that notion into his head, and a steam windlass couldn't drag it out of him. He wanted as little fuss made as possible, for the sake of the ship's name and for the sake of the owners, for the sake of all concern, says he, looking at me very hard. It made me angry hot. Of course you couldn't keep a thing like that quiet, but the chests had been secured in the usual manner and were safe enough for any earthly gale. While this has been an altogether fiendish business, I couldn't give you even an idea of. Meantime, I could hardly keep on my feet. None of us had a spell of any sort for nearly thirty hours, and there the old man sat rubbing his chin, rubbing the top of his head, and so bothered he didn't even think of pulling his long boots off. I hope, sir, says I, you won't be letting them out on deck before we make ready for them in some shape or other. Not, mind you, that I felt very sanguine about controlling these beggars if they meant to take charge. A trouble with a cargo of Chinamen is no child's play. I was damn tired, too. I wish, said I, you would let us throw the whole lot of these dollars down to them and leave them to fight it out amongst themselves while we get a rest. Now you talk wild, Jukes, says he, looking up in a slow way that makes you ache all over somehow. We must plan out something that would be fair to all parties. I had no end of work on hand, as you may imagine. So I set the hands going, and then I thought I would turn in for a bit. I hadn't been asleep in my bunk ten minutes when in rushes the steward and begins to pull at my leg. For God's sake, Mr. Jukes, come out. Come on deck quick, sir. Oh, do come out. The fellow scared all the senses out of me. I didn't know what had happened. Another hurricane or what? Could hear no wind. The captain's letting them out. Oh, he's letting them out. Jump on deck, sir, and save us. The chief engineer has just run below for his revolvers. That's what I understood the fool to say. However, Father Rout swears he went in there only to get a clean pocket handkerchief. Anyhow, I made one jump into my trousers and flew on deck aft. There was certainly a good deal of noise going on forward of the bridge. Four of the hands with the bosun were at work abaft. I passed up to them some of the rifles all the ships on the coast of China carry in the cabin and led them on the bridge. On the way I ran against old Saul, looking startled and sucking at an unlighted cigar. Come along, I shouted to him. We charged, the seven of us, up to the chart room. All was over. 
There stood the old man with his sea boots still drawn up to the hips and in shirt sleeves, got warm thinking it out, I suppose. Bun Hin's dandy clerk at his elbow, as dirty as a sweep, was still green in the face. I could see directly I was in for something. What the devil are these monkey tricks, Mr. Jukes, asked the old man as angry as ever he could be. I tell you frankly, it made me lose my tongue. For God's sake, Mr. Jukes, says he, do take away these rifles from the men. Somebody's sure to get hurt before long if you don't. Damn, this ship isn't worse than Bedlam. Look sharp now. I want you up here to help me and Bun Hin's Chinaman to count that money. You wouldn't mind lending a hand too, Mr. Rout, now you are here. The more of us, the better. He had settled it all in his mind while I was having a snooze. Had we been an English ship, or only going to land our cargo of coolies in an English port like Hong Kong, for instance, there would have been no end of inquiries and bother, claims for damages and so on. But these Chinamen know their officials better than we do. The hatches had been taken off already, and they were all on deck. After a night and a day down below, it made you feel queer to see so many gaunt, wild faces together. The beggars stared about at the sky, at the sea, at the ship, as though they had expected the whole thing to have been blown to pieces, and no wonder they had had a doing that would have shaken the soul out of a white man. But then they say a Chinaman has no soul. He has, though, something about him that is deuced tough. There was a fellow, amongst others of the badly hurt, who had his eye all but knocked out. It stood out of his head like the size of half a hen's egg. This would have laid out a white man on his back for a month, and yet there was that chap elbowing here and there in the crowd and talking to the others as if nothing had been the matter. They made a great hubbub amongst themselves, and whenever the old man showed his bald head on the foreside of the bridge, they would all leave off jawing and look at him from below. It seems after he had done his thinking, he made that Bun Hin's fellow go down and explain to them the only way they could get their money back. He told me afterwards that all the coolies having worked in the same place and for the same length of time, he reckoned he would be doing the fair thing by them as near as possible if he shared all the cash we had picked up equally among the lot. You couldn't tell one man's dollars from the others, he said, and if you asked each man how much money he brought on board, he was afraid they would lie and he would find himself a long way short. I think he was right there. As to giving up the money to any Chinese official he could scare up in Fu Chao, he said he might just as well put the lot in his own pocket at once for all the good it would be to them. I suppose they thought so too. We finished the distribution before dark. It was rather a sight, the sea running high, the ship a wreck to look at, these Chinamen staggering up on the bridge one by one for their share, and the old man still booted it and in his shirt sleeves, busy paying out at the chart room door, perspiring like anything, and now and then coming down sharp on myself or Father Rout about one thing or another not quite to his mind. He took the share of those who were disabled himself to them on the number two hatch. There were three dollars left over and these went to the three most damaged coolies, one to each. We turned to afterwards and shoveled out on deck heaps of wet rags, all sorts of fragments of things without shape and that you couldn't give a name to and let them settle the ownership themselves. This certainly is coming as near as can be to keeping the thing quiet for the benefit of all concerned. What's your opinion, you pampered mailboat swell? The old chief says that this was plainly the only thing that could be done. The skipper remarked to me the other day, there are things you find nothing about in books. I think he got out of it very well for such a stupid man. End of chapter 6 End of Typhoon by Joseph Conrad